It's just unheard of that I'm late. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone to the show. I hope hope we're live. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I think so. We're in. Sweet. Oh dear. <laughs> Let's just see. Hope the laptop's catching up. There we go. We're in. Awesome. Welcome everyone. I was a little bit late by about two minutes, um, but we're in. And let me know if you can hear me okay. It looks like my laptop is having a bit of a hard time. Give me a second. I think we're in. Sweet. Can you hear me okay? Please comment one in the chat if you can hear me fine and we can get going because I really hope I'm not talking to, <laughs> to no one. Uh, awesome. Philly's dad, you can hear me. That's good. Great. Zane, can anyone else hear me? <laughs> Uh, we had a bit of a storm on the south coast this today. Awesome. That's fantastic. Okay. Had a bit of a, a windy storm today, and uh, it seems like the signal was a little bit botched for a while. But I'm going to catch up and say hi to everyone. Lots of you are already here. Philly's dad, Giza, founder, Paul, Ben, uh, Mr. Perpetual, Neil, uh, Zane, Orange Hand, Dear Artifact, Thomas, Lawrence. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, one and all. I really hope I'm keeping up with the stream. I'm going to try and refresh the laptop as much as possible and keep up with everything. This is a big, big show. Uh, I must say that I was, in the beginning of the week, I thought, okay, doesn't seem like there's, there are going to be many watches sent in, but then the last minute, everything arrived. So I'm going to jump straight into it because we have a lot of watches on the show. And for those of you who might be new to the channel and new to this series, this is called Wrist Shot Week. It's simply a time when you send your watches in. Not seeing any picture, Christopher. Oh, duh. You can't tell me that. Please. Seeing now. Okay, good, good. Okay. Um, wrist Shot Week is just simply a time when you send your watches in. I curate and I put them all together. So if you look to the left of the screen now, you will see the submissions that came in as I scroll ever so slowly in the corner. I would say there were about 140 <laughs> 140 watches that came in. So it's going to be quite a long one, but I will condense it. I don't want to drag it out for far too long. Um, but we're going to get into it. There's so much variety. I, it just blew me away. Uh, everything from Lunga. Uh, I think there's a few Pateks. There's Omegas, Rolexes, APs, Hamiltons, Seikos, Zeniths, the whole deal. So I think you're really going to enjoy the variety. So I need to say hi to more of you. I, I hope you can hear me okay. There was a bit of a glitch at the beginning of the show. Uh, YouTube's had a bit of a, a, a tough time with just the sheer number of people, uh, you know, watching videos lately. And because of that, my uh, my community page is down. There's a few things that are a bit delayed. My, my page was actually bugging out the other day. So I hope you can all hear me fine. And let me just say hi to a few more of you. Founder Time is Capital. Welcome, James. Rooted. Christopher. Welcome. Maynard. Turkey Vulture. Uh, who else? Maz. Neville. So good. A lot of you guys sent in your watches, so I really hope you enjoy the show. So we always start with yours truly. Of course, I'd be wearing this watch. Um, I put a video out on this on Thursday. It was great fun talking about this watch and uh, just my, my take on it and how I've enjoyed wearing it over time. And speaking of which, if you can hear me all okay, can someone please comment just you can hear me? I think that's a good thing to start because I feel like I'm talking to dead air. The laptop was doing a couple of glitchy things. Uh, can someone just type, we can hear you? That will be a good way to start. Um, Neo, Ron, welcome. Uh, let's see. Okay, Ron, you can hear me? Fantastic. Okay, that's good. Okay, so um, mark this down in your calendars. April 9th, two weeks' time, Thursday. Uh, I'm going to be revealing my first, or unveiling my first luxury watch purchase. Two weeks' time, Thursday. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. So, April 9th, that's it, and everyone write that down, because that's when the unveiling is going to happen. The Thursday unveiling video is going to be there, and I think you'll enjoy it. So, let's get into the show, because there's just so much. Let's get started. We've already been talking for, what, like six minutes? Okay. First off, the, the man who actually created the cover photo. Every time the show begins, I like to credit the person who submitted the best photo that, that I found you know, the most appealing for the start of the show. And this is from Neil O. Um, Giza, thank you. Congrats. Yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, I sort of, I sniped the deal the beginning of this month, actually. And uh, it's, it's been great. The wearing experience has been awesome. 
And the nice thing is by the second week, I will be able to tell you just how it's been faring and how I've been enjoying it. So yeah, feeling that I picked up a Rolex Explorer. There's a couple of people that are saying that they will eat their hat uh, if I don't buy an Explorer. So, you know, uh, that's something to consider. Okay, so let's just, uh, where do we start? There's so many of you here. There's already 65 of you. Thank you all so much for joining. It's going to be quite a long one. I've got coffee, I've got some water, and we're just going to roll. So let me try and uh, wake myself up. Right, so the watch that was submitted, thanks to Neil O. I really enjoyed it, just because to me, it looks like the kind of photo that really epitomizes the Explorer 2. I think the, the lighting, the angle, you got every single detail. And it's just, it's a beautiful photo. There's no denying that everything is just highlighted in the greatest detail. We zoom right in and we see all the different textures, the colors used. Uh, he has a 35 millimeter lens, I think, that he that he took the, the photo with. And it's just a stunning photo. I thought it was just such a nice take on the piece. And as we get into it now, uh, we're starting with a bit of a different, let's see, Ron Shrink, did I already purchase a watch? No, Ron, I've already purchased the watch. I purchased it at the beginning of the month, but uh, I've uh, kept it under tabs. Two weeks time, the unveiling will happen and it, you'll enjoy it, trust me. Okay, so uh, we're going to start this a little bit differently because last night, Thomas sent me an email, Thomas from Paris. He was cooped up and he said, this is the first time I've been able to sit down and actually look at the watches in my collection and put them all together. He doesn't consider himself a collection, a collector, sorry. He doesn't consider himself a collector, but he's amassed a superb little set of pieces. So let's have a look at these before going. This is not technically wrist shot week, but uh, it's a great way to start the show. So here is his start of the pieces and just let just let that waft over for a second rob thank you for the super chat 2254 seamaster that's a that's a good guess um not going to let it slip and ron thinks bet a hundred dollars that he got an omega so i was thinking that we could do some kind of paypal betting scheme where we all put money into the pot and see just and you know if you win the bet then <laughs> you get the money that'd be quite a lot of fun uh, okay so right Let's just start this by talking about the set quickly. So Thomas sent this to me saying, basically he saw the, he saw the show appearing and he is not exactly one to talk about watches. He, he's not a collector. He doesn't consider himself a collector. He's just amassed these watches over 20 years. And he bought all of these watches. When we look at this, I'm just gonna slowly but surely pan through them. He bought the Snowflakes, uh, the Monte Carlo, the GMT, when they were relatively cheap, you know? And he's just had them for this period of time. Now he wouldn't dream of buying vintage watches for the prices they're going for. Uh, I don't know if that's a 5513. It kind of looks like one. Just a beautiful 1655 with its you know, original bracelet and the whole set. It's just gorgeous. Nice fuchsia fade on the 675, 1675. And then you've got a range of Tudors. And then we scroll down, we have a look at his Milgaus. Now, the, the funny thing is the only watch that he wears at the moment that he's really drawn to wearing is his Explorer. As you can see, I mean, check it out. This has really been worn. So of all the watches that you will be seeing in the in this show, because there are three sets of watches that he sent through, the Explorer is the one that he really loves. And he's deliberating what he should keep, what he should sell. And I want to do a review of this collection eventually, but I thought it'd be nice. Great way to start the show, just showing you the, the level of variety. Next in Thomas's set, a few more interesting pieces. We have what looks to be a Tudor, this actually says Rolex on the top and Tudor at the bottom. This is some kind of bubble back, I would imagine. And then we have some Tritons, just some vintage divers, uh, Fortis, another Monte Carlo, two Monte Carlos. Or oh, are they Monte Carlos? I don't know. I'm getting into the show ever so slowly, but they're just gorgeous. The condition is great. And across from here, I was actually having a close look at this. Remember, I get 150 photos. So, uh, I, I kind of rename the, the photo and save it, and that's me. I don't go to the lengths of studying everything that comes in. This looks like quite a piece. I think this is a Blancpain Aqualung. I don't know if it's an homage because I can't see the name on the dial, but it looks pretty legitimate. Anyway, so this is another set of pieces that he has. There's talk about don't show, sorry, don't sell. Uh, it's a good point. I think it's a good time to keep them for this period of time. And final times, again, if you'd like to catch my attention, comment, uh, comment at ID guy in the chat and I'll be able to see it quicker. 
um, some toys to play with. Absolutely, James. Um, so if if Thomas is on, I'm sure he'll be re-watching the show. Founder Time is Capital. You guys should really hook up because you're both based in Paris. I just think this is such a superb little set to begin with. And then last but not least in his selection of watches, he has a few. Now, this this Patek, I can't, I've, I know the reference. I can actually pull up the reference on my laptop because I did a, a discussion about it a while back. But it's a beautiful little Patek. Uh, it's got a few Bell and Ross pieces over here. Uh, Omega, this looks like one of those big eyed pieces, the automatic variant. And then we have a 50 Fathoms and we have a bit more of a modern take. Uh, your ETA Tudor, a uh, 50 Fathoms in its full size on the on the bracelet. Uh, let's see, is he there? Thomas Adu, there he is. Awesome. Well done. Great to have you here, Thomas. I hope I, I decided to push your collection up to the front. 5146. Thank you, Zane. This is a Patek 5146. Looks like a white gold, so it's a G. Um, great to have you here, Thomas. I thought to, be, to begin the show, we just run through your watches and get me warmed up at least. And then check this out on the right hand side. This looks like a Memovox. I don't know if this is American or if it's European, but this is a really nice little Memovox as well. So he's got a great set of pieces and I look forward to doing a proper review. It'd be nice to discuss these watches in more detail. Uh, just look at them all together and hypothetically say, if we were going to condense these watches down to like six, uh, what would we do? How would we go about it? It'd be a lot of fun to look at. Okay. So if I did miss your emails, I cut off the emails at eight o'clock this evening in the UK. Eric Bell says, and the winner is. Mm, I'm really liking this Aqualung uh, on the right-hand side. But over here, it's so difficult, you know? I mean, these two are in a league of their own. They're by themselves. These three actually are their own beast. It's very hard to just choose one. I, I just love the fact that he enjoys wearing the Explorer the most out of all of them, you know? Okay, so let's get into the show, start with wrist shots, and run from there. Starting with Alex, this was the last submission I saved, and this was right at closing time. And it's a Moser Pioneer with a limited blue dial. I actually did a collection review for In Something, who's just repl uh, replied in the chat. In Something, I've just done your review video. It's ready to go. That should be coming out, I would say, uh, next week or the week after Tuesday. And he has one of these Moser Pioneers. Very interesting watch. And I say that it manages to combine the idea of a sports and dress watch together in a few ways. Um, really fascinating. And by the way, if everyone's in the chat replying to Thomas's pieces, please, by all means, uh, comment on what you would like him to keep, what he should you know, lose, what he should sell. And we just get it rolling that way. Uh, the idea, I did say to him, the nice thing is that we can actually get the audience to comment on the watches that he should be interested in looking at and keeping and everything else. So this is a gorgeous watch, gorgeous photo. I think this is on a rubber strap as it comes standard. And it's an interesting piece. Really, the, the Moser family, we could consider them fairly new at this point in time because uh, they've just been rebought and they've been around for quite a short period of time. And they're doing some interesting stuff. And I uh, look forward to discussing N Something's collection because he has two of these pieces, one that's more dress oriented, one that's more sports oriented, but they do share a similar design language. Okay, next, jumping to Andrew, rocking a PAM 685. Yeah, the variety is just insane. Uh, you're going to have to be patient with me because <laughs> there's a lot of watches on show and uh, I'm going to have to slowly but surely get into it. Uh, Found the Times Capital, is that a Moser? Yes, it's a Moser Pioneer, and it's a special edition with a blue Fumé dial, if I remember right. Okay, so Andrew with this PAM. So this is the original Radiomere. This is really the one that started the whole trend in the family, and it's just beautifully symmetrical. Love the balance, the presence. Uh, there's a few Panerais on the show, uh, but of course, as we know nowadays, the watch has lost uh, you know, a lot of love in the community for X, Y, Z reasons. But I think he mentioned in his email that he loves this watch because it is the original uh, and because of the size and the presence. It's, it's quite unique in its own right. It has its own design language. And I think that's the reason why this watch in particular, the Radio Mirror, should get more attention. But uh, they are very big. I think these range like, what, 45 millimeters in size? Thank you for this, Andrew. And next, this is from, I don't know if this is from the same Andrew or if this is from another Andrew, but it is the Vacheron Constantin. Quai de Lille, I hope I got that right. 
Kwai de Lille. Uh, and the reference is 4500S. Fascinating watch. I mean, you just don't see these, you know. Uh, we're not marketed to about these watches, so we just don't know. And I, one element that I've just noticed now immediately is that the date window is fixed and this little hand, if I just move a bit closer, this little hand rotates around the dial. So it's, it's almost a sandwich dial in a way. It's a bit of depth, a bit of layering, and that color contrast is also interesting. It seems like VC is very big on the whole idea of dividing their numerals with these batons in the middle. It takes elements from the 56 line. I would imagine this watch originated around that period of time too, you know? Okay. Hitting the coffee. We've already been going for 12 minutes. It's pretty good. Uh, managed to get the show rolling fast enough. As it is, I think the show is going to be near to three hours because the variety is just nuts. And we're going to slowly but surely roll through all of these. Okay, next up. So thank you, Andrew, for these. I don't know if this is the same, Andrew, um, but it's great. I love these, these wrist shots. I must say, there are some incredible ones. Just use of contrast and lighting and clothing. It all adds to that presence. And uh, it's such a pleasure doing this. I can't thank you all enough for submitting your shots in because the variety is just insane. Um, it feels like you guys are in cahoots every single time because the watches are completely different from all of you. And uh, yeah, it's just nuts. Just when I thought the, the show would be staggering a bit, episode three, it's just gotten way better as we get further in. Okay, so this is from Andy. It's a SKX011J. They call it the Orange Boy, has a nickname. I don't know much about these pieces and, and the family of SKX name enough, but uh, interesting contrast, very lively looking piece. Cable knit sweaters are always compl always complimentary spot. Yeah, exactly, zero artifact. And if I am avoiding you in the chat, it's not because I'm, uh, I'm deliberately doing so. I am trying my utmost <laughs> to get the presentation out and getting to you guys, so yeah. As we can see, we're still on A, and we've got a lot to page through. And the variety is just nuts. OK, so next. Thank you, Andy, for this. Next is from Ant G, and I think he's in the chat. <laughs> the, the joke of all jokes is that, yeah, we have, we have a cool selection. So this is from Ant. Today, he decided to send me his El Primero uh, on a Bulang calf skin strap. Bulang and Sons, sorry. I do like add these little quips in the corner so I'm able to catch up, you know, Remind myself of why I, I labeled it. So Bulang and Sons supplied calfskin leather strap on a, this is the, the 1969 38 millimeter El Primero. And it's just perfect. It's just perfect. So I love the balance, love the colors. You just can't go wrong with this piece. I'm actually going to be bringing out a video soon talking about this watch and a few others, the, the outliers that I didn't go for with uh, this family of watches that I'm interested in, with the luxury uh, pickup choice and final purchase. Um, but I must say, owning an El Primero and a Reverso, they're two watches that really do sing the most. Um, for, for collectors, you know, it's one of those pieces that anyone can wear. And when you see someone wearing an El Primero, you can basically say, yeah, this, this dude knows watches, you know. Also love the contrast, love the leather strap and everything else. And in the background, if you know Ant G's watches, he's got a Berthier Submariner back there. He's got a Vacheron 56 that we featured on the show before. Mention about the date positioning being off. Uh, it's, it is a peculiar thing. I mean, this is what Zenith has done with all of their movements. This caliber has always had the date position at the, what, four, four and a half position. And I really like it, actually. And you shouldn't because it is kind of in the way. But what's nice is that it's not in such a position that it, that it really clashes with the subdials and all of those details. I find it quite commendable. Even at the six o'clock position, it can get in the way of things. But where it's placed offset, you only really notice it when you look for it, which is quite a unique thing about this, the layout. And I'm getting my magic mouse hand sorted out so you can see that uh, I'm, I'm pulling the screen all over the place. Yeah, and Richard, that's a, that's a Vacheron 56 in the corner at the back here, yeah, boutique edition. Featured it on the show, I think, the other two weeks ago when we started this. Okay, next. Also from Ant G. And the biggest joke of all is that, so, so this is his like pride and joy. How can it not be Saxonia Thin? And this afternoon, another Saxonia Thin was sent in. So I find it pretty funny that we're going to be seeing two rose gold Saxonia Thins in one episode <laughs> from two different people. Uh, but this is just beautiful. Let's have a look at the face first. This is his uh, pride and joy, as we can imagine. I mean, it's just beautiful. It's, it's a pocket watch. 
in a condensed form. It's a langa. Uh, it's so understated. Nobody knows what you're wearing. And there's something really charming about that idea. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing just how langa has been hyped up over the last few months. Uh, everyone's been talking about them and it's getting a lot more popularity. You see channels like Watchbox uh, trying to sell them a lot more. Um, yeah. And it's, it's in, we've always known that it's in line with Patek and the way that they present themselves. They've done an amazing job in this field. And I think anyone in our hobby, even if you're someone who only wants to own one watch, I think a Lunga is also a great addition to any collection just because of it being so, of so much of an outlier, frankly. Okay, so Richard, Lunga is my favorite. That's awesome. Watches and giggles, welcome. There's a few of you I haven't said, there's a lot of you that I haven't said hi to, but uh, that's how it always is. Forbin Colossus, welcome to the show. Um, hands should not be silver. And I think you're talking about the, the Zenith. I don't know. Uh, let's slowly but surely get through here. Great. Okay. Peter Smith, welcome to the show. And Ron says he thinks it beats the 5196. Interesting point because they are very different watches. I mean, the 5196 is the staple of the Patek line. Honestly, I think the 5196 has greater provenance than this watch just because of it being you know, linked to the reference 96, was it, the original Calatrava, and that they've been able to carry that line all the way through. But in saying that, though, what this watch does better than the Patek is that this is much more of a pocket watch in the way it presents itself. And in that way, it has a greater tie to German design, German roots. So it's interesting. Uh, you can't, I wouldn't, it's comparing apples and oranges, really. They are both just terrific in their own right. They are just superb when it comes to watchmaking, their attention to detail. The families are completely different, and I think that's what makes them just so interesting to look at. Okay, next, Ben. M Technic, welcome. There's a few more of you saying hi. Next is from Ben, and this is a Hamilton Kharki AV, aviation pilot. And if I'm not wrong, I think I think you mentioned that this is the watch that was used in Interstellar, the film. This was the, the cover girl for Interstellar. And it is a really interesting piece for a lot of reasons. Military inspired. And there's a few Hamiltons on the show that we'll get through. Okay, the Interstellar, dear artifact, thank you. Okay, who else is joining? Jose, welcome. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, so many of your names. Zahid, welcome to the show. Nick Jones, Nick J. Um, Mr. Perpetual, I think I've said hi to a lot of you already. Julian, welcome. So, uh, Ben Space Vulture, this is your watch that you sent in. And it really is an interesting watch for a few reasons. You know, military inspired, military dial. I don't know if they took any inspiration from uh, other watches in their line to come up with this or if this was wholly unique. But uh, it's got a very military-inspired layout with its 10, 15. So it's technically, that's very interesting. You never see this layout. How would you best describe it? The quarters are summed up by the individual elements, by the minutes themselves, not, not numerals. And then on the inside, we have your breakdown of the numerals per hour. Fascinating. I must say, I haven't had much time looking at this watch in the past, so it's it's cool seeing these, and the photo is also terrific. It's something I should also say. This reminds me of the driftwood I had in my discus tank many years ago. I'm a big fish guy, so uh, I used to love wooden tanks with clown loaches and discus and uh, tiger barbs and the whole deal. Also love planted aquariums, but yeah, getting into that topic. Um, okay, moving on. We are only on B. We've been going for 12 minutes, which is pretty great. Okay, next, and I think this is from the same Ben, or this is another Ben, but it's a 19, no, this is a different Ben. This is a 1940s Bulliver. Now, check that out. That is so interesting. Right at the cusp where we were transitioning from Deco into the more modern lineup of things, and we get to see just how it keeps a lot of those motifs, like the, like the numeral placement and the styling. Uh, strange, peculiar-looking hands, but still quite a Deco-inspired case. So I feel like this is late 30s. This could be, you know, 38-ish. Very interesting watch. I'm going to drop into the chat and say hi to a few more of you, if I can. Um, let's see. Cheetown, have you owned cherry shrimp? No, but I've owned blue shrimp before. These really rare ones, and they were massive. I can't remember their names. It's been a long time, so I'm probably I'm going to butcher the, the names if I, if I do think about it. Um, okay. And something, I had a whole discus, I had a whole lot of discus and 15-year-old clown loaches. Yeah, I mean, they're just, they're such amazing fish. Uh, 
anyway, Hamilton has a mad case. Uh, yeah, if we haven't, I'm, you see, I'm so slow with the chat. I'm missing a lot of you guys. Good morning from Australia, Jerry. Welcome to the show. Um, and Giza's asking me what coffee I'm drinking. I don't know. It's it's what I can find in the shops. Honestly, this was a this was a Tesco, easy to grab. I mean, the shop the shop lifting that's been going on lately. If you if you can find coffee, you're lucky enough. The one thing that I've been struggling to find is flour, and it's just the most irritating thing in the world. Anyway, so there's talk about this this Hamilton being inspired by many Flieger elements. I should have woken up to the fact. I am still slowly but surely warming up, but there are lots of Flieger elements. I didn't even address the sword hands. And look how well they've actually skeletonized the handset here. So it allows for you to actually see the hour inside the hand, which is just great. And yeah, interesting. With a day-date complication, I mean, geez, how, how often do we find day-dates on watches at this price point? It's a really interesting piece. I should do a bit more research into this watch and as time goes by. Okay, so back to this 40s Bolivar. Fascinating watch, right? Strange use of numerals and placement. I really like how he's managed to capture the the dark gradient underneath and how you know the light just hits the painted on plots here. It's it's fascinating. You get a good three-dimensional blend of light. Okay. Jumping to the next. And let's see, founder's saying, love the vintage and art deco Boulevard watches. There's so many of them. And and talk about Hamilton, yeah, it's very underrated. Tick love, you'll see a lot of Hamiltons um, as we go through. There are a few that have been sent in this week. Type B dial. Thank you, Richard, of course. Okay, Ben, this is also from Ben, another Ben, <laughs> and it's an Omega Speedy Mark IV. And I can't remember what the watch was that he sent me the following week or last week, but uh, it's very interesting seeing a Mark IV. And I, I do plan on doing a full like historical coverage of all the different generations that have come and gone, uh, Mark IIs, IVs, Fives, 5.5s, you know, the whole deal. Um, let's see, there was a question about aquariums. Aquariums cost more than watches in something basically says they are hellish expensive. No denying there. Um, it's, it's just nuts. And dealing with discus fish and everything else. Yeah, they're the, they're the hardest fish to deal with, but it's such a rewarding hobby. Really want to get back into collecting fish again in the future. Okay, so let's just see what else is going on. Is that a Mark 4.5, Eric? I don't know. I don't know if it's a 4 or a 4.5. You guys can clarify that. But... It's, it's really interesting seeing how they transitioned in that, that time period of the 70s and the 80s. And they were just experimenting with all they could, just throwing everything around <laughs> and hoping that something would stick with their ideas. Um, the Mark II is still the watch that I find just so interesting for its time. Surprisingly, there are no Mark IIs featured on the show this week, but we've had multiples on other shows. So it's just, it's just mad. And there's mention about Spanish on the dial. So this is actually a Spanish day date complication thank you for that very interesting uh, but of course you know since i haven't studied these watches i am pro not the best person to ask with regards to the movements and all those details just what it does but it's an all-rounded creature and you can really see it looks like it's it's incorporated that nautilized effect the, the integrated bracelet we're deep into the 70s with a watch like this you know okay so ben thank you so much for sending this in and next is blue shirt buddha who is very well known on this platform we all know Blue Shirt. And this is his 214270 Mark I with the white gold numerals. And we discussed this, I think, two weeks ago when we ran the, you know, the last wrist shot week. And we were speaking about, no, we weren't. We were, there, was, there was a discussion about the, uh, the blackout variant of the, the, one, the 114270 and just how these numerals, the way they've been placed, gives you that same idea of a blackout effect. And the question is whether these watches are going to increase in popularity now, because the joke is they're actually, when, when we compare them to the Mark II variants, uh, they are quite sort well attainable because people just generally don't like the idea of a full white gold numeral set. The bonus is that you get white gold on your watch, a lot more of it, you know? The T-Rex Explorer, <laughs> so funny, supersonic hippo, yeah. He's referring to the, the hour and the minute hands being used on the 36 millimeter variant. And uh, this was a strange watch. We could, you know, you, you don't want to call it a Franken watch, but it was really a mishmash of parts. Um, it's sad when a company doesn't, you know, pay more attention to their launch before the time. And uh, I, I still don't think 
these little details like the smaller hands mars the dial i mean you can see everything perfectly it really doesn't affect the visual presence you can tell the time to the minute very easily um and i was going to say something else but i lost my train of thought tick love yes it is a 39 mil so this is the first generation of the 39 millimeter variant and uh lots of people saying beautiful it is just a gorgeous watch i mean the explorer it's the explorer don't need to say anything else really you know um carlos from panama great having you here sir hope you're doing well and yeah we've been going through this pretty quick it's great i'm surprised that we've been able to jump into the show and just run with it before uh you know i talk myself to sleep for the first 20 minutes and everyone's talking about fish what fish collection you know collecting and everything else is great okay so uh interesting richard said i wonder if they'll change the 39 mil explorer this year no idea um there's there's all sorts of debates you can see all of my renders where i played around with all sorts of ideas that was a lot of fun doing those those prediction videos and just throwing renders around and putting vintage numerals on a modern watch and you know everything else anyway there's quite a lot of explorers on the show which is great so we will get to this now next so thank you blue shirt for this um Oko zen i see you there welcome you say terrariums are better than aquariums hmm hmm might have to have a bit of a debate on that one. <laughs> uh, it's, I like the I like it when you get to blend the two, you know. Um, and James says, when do you think the changes will be announced from from Rolex? <sighs> anyone's guess. Um, it really is anyone's guess at this point in time. I have a feeling that they'll be going online and doing the announcements instead of doing it at an event at this point. I mean, considering the, the state of the world, but who knows? Um, it's always good to be surprised. I know Odinki is going to surprise us with a. With the posting all of a sudden okay so next up this is from bobby and i would like to take this time to shout out everyone in the world who is doing the hard work while we're all relaxing sitting at home doing what we're doing uh bobby is a medic and he's working in florida at the moment in a hospital and he said to me i need one watch that i can wash religiously whenever to stop contamination and he decided to pick up to wear this piece as his one watch during this period of time and yeah i'd really like to take this moment just to really say for everyone who does the simplest tasks like delivery someone who looks after a store you are the people who are doing the greatest service to all of us at the moment you know and in the medical field i mean they deserve all the respect so yeah, it's a privilege. It really is a privilege. And thank you all for your hard work for doing this, keeping us safe, keeping everyone safe at this point in time. So really, Bobby, thank you for sending this in. And nice choice. What a great choice, you know? Uh, he uses this in theater. I'm pretty sure he's a surgeon. I can't remember what he said in, in detail. But uh, he's been wearing this on and off the whole time, washing it as often as possible. And he needed something that could take a good wash. So yeah it's great nice and rugged superb and i love that contrast between the rubber and the and the blue highlights uh, the submersible next to the radio mirror it's quite a, a different and <laughs> quite a contrast between the two pieces you know the radio mirror really was something it looks pretty old-fashioned nowadays we look at this watch and we, we can't really place the time period when this watch was made you know it feels like something that's managed to transcend that era quite a bit clap for bobby yeah absolutely Okay, so again, to all the healthcare professionals, to everyone who is supplying us with food, supplies, groceries, everything else, you are the real heroes in the story that we are currently living in. And uh, yeah, really hats off to all of you. Okay, next to Brandon. So Bobby, thank you very much for this. Next to Brandon, El Primero Star King. So we've just had a look at a 1969 El Primero. This is very interesting one because it beats to a tenth of a second so every time you hit that chronograph this hand it's, it's a special anniversary piece i can't they call it the striking tenth um i can't remember the full extent of the story i didn't read the, the description of it but it's it's an interesting watch i mean we know zenith and the el primero movements are legendary and this one just takes it up a notch in many ways the the idea that this Every 10 seconds, this hand does a full sweep, I think, if I remember right. And uh, interesting use of symmetry. There was talk a second ago just how the sub date is on the four o'clock position and how it looks peculiar. 
over here it's nice and symmetrical, but the issue is that you you sacrifice subdial space to to get everything looking balanced. Let's pull it in a bit closer if I can. But in saying that though, I just I think it's it's such a nice combination again of colors and space and placement. I love the fact that Zenith doesn't sacrifice elements on its dial to have everything there. You know, it's complete. And I'll say again, I think, <laughs> dear artifact, the red hand always makes me think about communist Russia. Yeah, I feel the same way. That's one element that I find always reminds me of the Tsar and, and that whole area of the world. It's funny, right? I mean, uh, I, I need to remember the history of the Zenith star and what it really means. But uh, Zenith being the peak of performance, I think they they really have their own market segment with the watches they make. And uh, it's just superb. And I, Mariner in Japan, it's a pleasure. I, I hope you enjoyed the watch. <laughs> I don't know what watch it was that I featured, but uh, yeah, it's it's an absolute pleasure. Okay, let's say hi to everyone else. If there's any more of you in the chat while I get around to this. Um, it's too much on the Zenith, Ben Space Vulture says. Okay, so uh, it does, it looks really big. I think these are 42 mils. They're not 39 or 38 mils. These are 42. They're a little bit bigger. Quite a lot of presence. Interesting strap though, right? Look at that texture. So it's like a rough, very rough suede finish to it. Um, but I just think the El Primero, it's, it's amazing just how colors and dial layout can pretty much highlight exactly the watch that you're looking at. You don't even need to, you know, blink and you know it's a zenith just by the way it's arranged. And then the finishing and the movement, as Neo says, it's just terrific. Okay, carrying on next. This is to Brian. And Brian submitted a Serica. So Serica Watches is a brand that was founded by Matt Aranek, or he was, he was a part of, of the found, founding process. It's a French company, and they wanted to try and combine elements of field watches, mill spec pieces into this one creation. And they're doing a great job. Uh, let's have a look at if anyone see again, I, I don't. I'm I'm running the show like five seconds faster than the chat, and then then the, the actual watch is appearing on the screen. So uh, probably missing a few. So it is. So Eric Bell saying very unusual. Nick, you say spell Serica. I can actually type it. Let me type it in the chat here. That's how you spell it. Serica watches, and interesting combination. We have a broad arrow hand. We have. I mean, this handset looks like something that belongs to an Amiga. Uh, we have field watch motifs that looks like it's been taken from, you know, we, we, if we look at the, the way the dial's been arranged, these quarters looks like an IWC Mark 11 in a way. We've got a, a Type B style dial set with 24-hour time in the center and your, gen your general 12-hour time on the outside. But I do like, one element that I really like about a watch like this is the use of brushing and polishing. We see that it doesn't have a fully polished bezel. It's actually polished on the flank and brushed on the top, which means that it's not going to look as bad when it gets scuffed up and scratched. You know, you, you could wear it and pull it off to an extent where you don't necessarily see the scratches for a long period of time until it gets really damaged. But um, interesting combination of elements. I think the whole design story was that they, they set out to create a watch that uh, could be your one watch, and uh, they've done a pretty good job. I actually reached out to Serica a while ago. Um, pronunciation is correct. I'm friend. Thank you, Mooseman. I hope I'm saying it right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, yeah, interesting piece and great combination of elements. It's one of those field watches that could double as a sports watch and a dress watch. It has all the boxes ticked. And if we know Matt Haranek, who is the he wrote A Man and His Watch and uh, what else? W, uh, what's it? W.M. Brown Project. W.H. Brown Project, I think. Um, he, he knows his watches pretty well, and he's had quite a great collection over the years. So, yeah. Any Gerard Perigo absolute today? Richard K. Richard, there, there is, I think there's, there's a great Ulysses Nardan on the show. It comes up later. I don't think... Uh, I don't think it's a Sheryl Perigo. We can keep going. I mean, I really, when it comes to me, I, I name the person, I drop the reference of the watch in, that's it. And there's like 150 of you, so sometimes I, I miss a thing or two, but we'll have a look. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, for the appreciation on the Smith's video. It was a lot of fun to put together. 
Um, it wasn't exactly a, f a video, it was a slideshow. All I can say is that April 9th, if you can put this on your calendar, Thursday, April 9th, two weeks time, you will see the unboxing of my first luxury watch. And there's a lot of video footage, lots of sound splicing where I get to, you know, you can hear the class closing and everything else. So it's gonna be great. Uh, lots of photos, lots of video. And the beginning is quite a nice justification about the purchase and why I chose it. So yeah, we are going to enjoy it. Okay, so let's um, see, Cedar Canoe is next. And I think he might be in the chat. Uh, let's see what else is going on here. Uh, nice Zin. So this is the Zin STSA ABE, and I hope I got that right. But it's it's all blue, and I think this is a special edition from the family. It does have that tropical brown on the dial, on the bezel as well. And Zin and their watches, I mean, I really need to make some bullet points and mark down the watches uh, that, I, that I want to talk about in the Zin family especially, like the 104 the 103, and then move into these more obscure pieces, like like the U, what's it, the U1. I definitely want to look at the U1 in more detail, create some kind of uh, some kind of background. So uh, Jerry says, can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be cool. It's going to be cool. And Flip and Zipper, yeah. I mean, it's I've had the watch for over a month at this point, very close to a month. And I just decided, you know, time was right. Uh, the, the opportunity arose. Uh, I bought at Gray Market, which is just terrific. and um, yeah, that's all I'll say, but it, it just worked out for the best. And let's see, there was a mention for too old. Uh, your Smith's video was timed unnervingly well. Got a 40 millimeter Everest this week myself. Too old for two wheels. It's amazing. I mean, I had a few comments saying that they got the watch like an hour, an hour before the show went up and everything else, before the video. And yeah, I'm just glad. I mean, there's, there's like 140 comments. I do want to get back to them next week. I want to sit down and reply to all of them because there were some questions about the piece and everything else. So thank you very much for the Cedar Canoe. Uh, we know that this watch is very aviation inspired. I mean, they have a day-date complication. It's such a great balance on the dial. Zinn is typically Zinn by the way they present themselves. And I think any good watch brand is able to be recognized by its key characteristics. Just the bracelet. I mean, this bracelet is purely Zinn at this point in time, you know? Um, Zinn is what IWC used to be, Ron the Shrink. That's very well said, Ron. Uh, you know, the it's it's interesting. I, I think what also makes a good point is the, the prices of these watches, the, the brand and the value of the, the pieces that they sell uh, at the current price. You know, some brands get very greedy with their name. And because of that, they kind of price out their audience, which is pretty sad, you know? Okay, so let us love the countdown bezel. It's cool, right? Okay, moving on. This is also from Cedar Canoe. I think it's a different angle on a, looks like a distressed khaki strap that he's wearing with it as well to match the, the numerals and everything else. This was great. So thank you, Cedar Canoe. I'm sure you might be in the chat or you will be seeing this very soon. And Frank, looking forward to the unboxing. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Uh, let's see, Fobatina, okay. Faux Rolex, okay. Reed Kutchkrank. Very interesting point. There were a few people talking about it. And let's move on to the next watch because I think this has some proper patina. So this is from Sevi and it's a Zodiac Seawolf, a proper, an original Zodiac Seawolf by the looks of things. And he's got, uh, with dog, I said in the corner, there's a few dog shots. It'd be so good to get more dog shots in the show. Uh, who doesn't love dogs? Talking about faux patina and all of that. Uh, Hans, have I bought the watch? Yes, I bought the watch. I've, I've had it for a little while and I'm going to be unveiling it very soon. Is that Hugo? Turkey says, yes, it is. That's what he, he mentioned. Hugo the dog was his, uh, his photo. I, d I didn't understand that because again, I'm just, I'm just scrolling through everything most of the time. So, okay, let's talk about faux patina and that whole idea. There was a great point made by someone. <laughs> I can't even remember who it was. But it was the idea of if you change the name of faux patina to color, you know, uh, khaki, finish, just just paint instead of giving the, giving the impression that it's faux, uh, it could change our perspective on the effect of watches. You know, it's, it's a styling for the most part. Um, okay, uh, T Tanzil says, welcome to the show, Tan. Is it daylight savings time in the UK? I think it is. And I can't remember. I think, I think by one o'clock it goes back an hour or it stays... It stays for one hour, I don't know, but we are going back an hour in the next few, you know, the next hour or so. Uh, so yeah, 
technically I should run the show for four hours just to catch up, you know? Um, so this is awesome. It's the original, I, I would imagine this is an original Seawolf just because of its its texture and the, the finishing and a bit of patina and damage in places. Um, and I did a video on the Seawolf recently talking about it. It was, as we know, the real first commercially sold, sold dive watch, beat Rolex to market. Um, and compared to the 50 Fathoms, which was being used by military forces at the time, this one became extremely popular for its price and for its everything that it offered uh, a broad audience. And even now, what they're doing, it's great. I mean, the evolution of the brand and just what's happening now. Zodiac is owned by the Fossil Group at this point. And it's, it's superb that they are still offering their watches great value for money and the build quality is great. Uh, they're still keeping to those original design details, but also splicing it up in a few places, you know? Okay, too old for two wheels. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat. Quick message to you horology and design fans out there. Stay safe, take it easy. Look out for your family, neighbors in these trying times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't want to bring up the topic too much because it's just, you know, I avoid the news. I don't listen to it at all because I think it's just so dour. Um, but really, the most important thing is that you look after yourselves and your family at this point in time, of course. Do whatever is necessary and really stay indoors. It's the secret. Okay, an hour longer, Meeson. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, clocks go forward at one o'clock. Thank you, Philip. Okay. Oh, and Tan, by the way, Tanzil, welcome and thank you for uh, joining. Also wanted to say congratulations. Uh, on your new Polar Explorer that is the cover photo for the show. I think I saw it like a day ago, something you were, you were highlighting it on, on Instagram. So it's great. Um, okay, anything for ratings, as Ruja Drota says. I know, it's just unbelievable. Okay, moving on. Thank you for this, Chevy. So great seeing this piece, a proper original Seawolf. Okay, Chi-Town, California, with a Seiko Save the Ocean. And it's a tuna, no, it's a turtle. Okay, it's a turtle. And we were talking about this a while back. And just, I, I think what is so good about this, when we talk about a brand and the way they are approaching a subject, it's amazing to think that all they needed to do was to change the color scheme of the watch to blue. And most of us in the community knows it's the save the ocean piece. And they've done this with a whole range. They did it with a tuna. I think they did it with a samurai or a sumo as well. And it's just amazing that one color can actually, you know, define a segment of the brand. And we just know what it is representing and what it's trying to do and everything else. Um, and this is great. I mean, Chai Town has an interesting taste in watches. And I just love these photos. I mean, the quality is there. We get to see it in the full light gradient as, as uh, was a dear artifact said. Awesome gradient to the bezel. We know that the bezel has a different color scheme. The dial is nice and explosive as well. So this was great. Thank you for the submission. Uh, let's see what else. They did it with the samurai. Thank you, Shai Tom. Okay. So, Doc BBC, we ever reacting unless you respect back as much. Yeah, exactly, Ron. That's the truth. Okay. So we're getting in. Ryan, welcome to the show. Kevin, there's so many of you who are joining who I haven't said hi to, but welcome everyone to the show. We've got so much variety on offer that's going to be happening soon. I honestly don't know. <laughs> Once again, since it's alphabetical, I have to go down the list. Uh, seems like Apple lacks alphabetical order. But we're going to see from Seiko suddenly jumping to Lunga, if you're lucky. It's, it's very much a raffle, which I love. Uh, the variety is just nuts, and we just don't know what's coming up next. So this is from Chili Badger, who should be in the chat. I think I saw him a second ago. And I, what's the cat's name? Ming. Ming is the cat, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Uh, just having a chill. And this is a Seiko BFK. And it's something like Big Freaking Kinetic. <laughs> I got that right. Uh, and the reference is SKA371. You know, I, I struggle with all of these details, but it is a part of the, the Prospects line, as is the Save the Ocean Turtle, this little Prospects badge. Um, I, what I do like about this watch, I find the, the bracelet integration quite interesting. The way it's it's technically a solid end link, but it's not, and it, it rides the line on both sides. Um, what's nice is that when you fit this with a, a rubber or a leather strap, you don't have that vacant space between your wrists, you know, that, that negative space on the inside. Um, and I think my lecturer actually owned one of these watches back in university. And he was constantly adjusting the clasp and the bracelet. I think he was struggling to get a good fit. 
because this watch is pretty big. I would imagine it's what, like 42 mils? But I distinctly remember him wearing one of these. And look at that depth to the dial. It's quite something, right? Um, I, what is it, depth 200 meter rating? Also love the hands. It's amazing what Seiko has done with their use of just dial and numeral placement and the handsets that they've chosen. It's distinctly theirs at this point in time. So Chili Badger, if you're in the chat, thank you for sharing this piece. And we're getting through it. Let's go to Chris rocking a Stover Flieger gray left-hand drive in a very busy train by the looks of things. <laughs> uh, he's obviously gone for the model without any, uh, any details on the dial, just simple, clean layout. Um, with a gray gray finish, and I'd imagine this is quite the sunburst effect in light. I didn't even know they made left-hand drive variants of these watches, and I think he's rocking it on a NATO strap. Let's get it close up. Well, I jump back to the chat. Let's see, and hit the coffee while I'm at it. Talk about multitasking, right? <clears throat> right. <laughs> the cat is thinking he'll be where the watch one day. Yeah, it's funny. There's a few dogs, and, and I think there's a couple more cats featured in the show as well. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so Carlos, thank you so much for the super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. And there are some great watches coming up. I can't wait. I don't want to unveil them all. I think if you follow me on Instagram, you might have seen them. I kid you not, the last like, hour before the show, everything just arrived. And I was packing up and then thought, no, these watches have to be shown. Um, and it's a Type A. Welcome, Matthew, from New Zealand. Matthew always tunes into the show. Type A Flieger, it's always cool. And I like the idea that it's a left-hand drive. And I, uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't know if this was him who, who was wearing. No, it's not him. Someone else was wearing a watch on their right wrist and said because he was wearing a sub on his left wrist and he just picked up the watch from an AD and everything. I can't remember who it was, but... Interesting watch. And we know Stovo is one of those watches similar to Lunga and uh, what other makers? Who else made Fliegers back in the day? Laka, another brand. They all were in that same family during the Second World War and they've all gone their own ways, but Stovo is very much their own brand still. I think they use ETAs that are modified with their pieces now, but the, the value you get for these watches, it's pretty impressive. I mean, you get clear case backs uh, and all the details are there. And they've modernized it too. They've brought the size down. Uh, they've made it a bit more wearable for every day. And also like the idea that he's got a khaki jacket on, so it sort of blends with the skin. Very nice. So Chris, thank you so much for this. And there's another Chris submission. Which Chris was this? I don't know. <laughs> thank you, Chris. We've got another one. And this is not, we, this is our third El Primero, and this is not the, um, the 10 second one. This is a... 42 mil, just a standard 42 mil El Primero, if I'm not wrong. Someone please clarify that in the chat. Amazing that we've seen three of these already. And uh, I don't know, the 42, the 42 mil is polarizing. Stover, thank you, Miesen. Um, see, I'm, I'm from a place where uh, we learn Dutch, basically. So we, we struggle with a few of the German dialects. Uh, we, we, got, we got the Gs and everything down, right? But uh, yeah, thank you. So 42 mils, it's a bit of a divided subject, whether this watch should remain at 42 or if it should sit in that area of, of 38 or 39, like the originals. It's amazing. Yeah, you guys love these El Primeros, Zane. Exactly. And Zane, you're up last, and your watch is by no means last on the list. I mean, just since Zane is Zed, of course, he's last in the show, but he's got a great Patek to show everyone, so uh, we'll keep it going. <laughs> I think we have an El Primero virus. That's funny. Okay. So getting through, thank you for this El Primero. We've seen three of them already. I think there's a few more. <laughs> and if the, if the watch wrangler is in the chat, he sent this in last week. This was him stuck in traffic in his little, his little MR2. This is his Moser that he hasn't stopped wearing, wearing a combat strap. His Moser that he hasn't stopped wearing, comma, wearing a combat strap. Combat straps, that's the brand, I think. Uh, nice seeing the texture of this. I mean, it's it's amazing how thick that grain is. You'd be you'd be hard pressed to think if that's you know real or not, because generally when you see alligator or crocodile straps, uh, they're they're very tapered in. You don't see the scales so bold, but that contrast is something to look at, right? This is yellow gold, I would imagine. It doesn't look like rose, but seeing it with that light brown 
great amount of texture. It really is striking, right? Wrangler style, Turkey Vulture. That's funny. <laughs> uh, it's great. I mean, Clive, Clive has some interesting tastes. It's so nice seeing, I mean, it's amazing. His collection is quite something. It would be great to just cover a full, uh, you know, however many watches. He has like 80 watches. It'd be great to cover his, his series of pieces and what he's had over the years. And uh, he's, I mean, that, that Omega Speedmaster 321 that he stole, that will forever live in our minds as the one that really, you know, ruins everything. <laughs> uh, okay, Flip and Zippo, thank you so much for the super chat. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, and your, your watch is in here somewhere. I think I tagged you Flip and Zippo as well, so we'll be able to see you. Um, but the stud, like the strap he's got on, color looks great. It is nice, right? Very different, very different. You would just imagine a generic croc strap, but this from combat straps, of course, this is all custom handmade. Uh, you get to see some great texture. Love the stitching too. It matches the stitching matches the gold so nicely. It's it's almost piece for piece the right color. Fantastic. Okay, slowly but surely getting through. I don't think the Wrangler is in the chat. He was in the beginning. Um, okay, next getting through. We're now at we now at D. This is from Daniel, AP offshore diver. I think he sent this in last week as well, or. Uh, earlier in the week, don't worry. If you send your wrist shots earlier on, I do manage to save them all if I can. And this watch is, is a strange one, right? Uh, you don't expect AP to create a diver like this. And if I'm not wrong, this is the only diver that they've made in the family. Um, I, what I do love is the idea that even though it's a Royal Oak, it doesn't you know, negate the fact that you, you still have a Royal Oak. Uh, the bezel is the real character of the watch. And the idea of having an inset bezel is quite something. Uh, it makes it really completes it. And I think the watch is 42 mils, but with the added interior bezel, it brings the visual presence down ever so slightly. And we can really see that on show here. It's great. I mean, the contrast is awesome as well. <laughs> Robocop vibes. That's so funny. Um, and Zane says there's also a diver exactly the same, but full black. Yeah, in ceramic. And this is a few variants. I think there's one in like green with, with blue highlights. Uh, this one is definitely the most, one of the most subdued. Uh, this reminds me of the 90s, really. I think of growing up with those huge digital watches that all the kids used to wear, you know, that would disperse sweets and stuff. I, I think the color on this, it actually reminds me, I had a Swatch. One of my first watches was a Swatch, and it had pirate ships and things on it. I, you know, but it was the same color set. It was yellow accents and blue everywhere. <laughs> Dead or alive, you're coming with me, punk. <laughs> uh, Robocop was just, you know, a funny story. Um, I was sick one day at home. This is how I got introduced to Robocop and Jaws. Just think of this. You're what, nine years old. Let's stick on the, this is a funny story. I think you'll enjoy it. I must have been about eight or nine years old. I was sick at home. Um, Mum had to go work, so dad stayed at home with me. And he rented on the same day Robocop and Jaws. We watch them back to back, okay? And there's this whole joke going around that you, unless you've experienced Robocop as a child, you just don't know what life is, you know? <laughs> Speedy Paul says, is that a helium release valve? No, it's not. That's a screw down crown that is, that is used to adjust the inset bezel. So you would unscrew it and then it has a very satisfying click. I've actually, I've actually adjusted this before. It's got a very interesting click to it. And uh, it only works one way, if I'm not wrong. No, it does. No, it works both directions. And very tactile in the way it functions. But ultimately, unless, I don't know how water resistant it is, but it's, it's an interesting blend of elements. The, the, the yellow accent as well, lining up with the details on the bezel. So you could count down your time pretty easily. Anyway, so the story goes briefly is that uh, I experienced Jaws and Robocop when I was, what, eight or nine years old. I distinctly remember seeing Sam's Murphy, right? Getting shot to pieces <laughs> in that, that famous scene and just thinking to myself, what, what is going on? I'm just terrified, you know? And apparently in the 80s, everyone went to watch. It was rated a, 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 PG, a PG rating. It wasn't even 13 back in the day. And it was supposed to be family fun. <laughs> oh, what a laugh. Yeah, Robocop. First and the only time you need to watch it is when, if you have a child, Put it on for your child. VHS, you know, old school, just rock it. I saw Robocop at seven. The guy drives into the acid. Yeah, it's horrifying, right? Two old two wheels. That's another element. I mean, that and the shotgun scene and the machine guns and everything, just the 
pieces going everywhere. It was just, it's, and then Jaws straight after that. So not only do I have a fear of, you know, just just phobia of everything after that film. <laughs> and the guy, yeah, the guy just falls to pieces. Exactly, Hans, his face melts. Anyway, so thank you for this. This was from Daniel. Great seeing the offshore diver. Love the blue and the yellow. Very striking blend of elements. It's casual, but also sporty, which is surprising. I wonder how many people actually use this watch in the ocean. Um, okay, next from David, Mr. Perpetual. And I hope he's rocking this right now. This, I, I hope I'm saying this right. This is a 39 millimeter, no? It's a Planet Ocean. I don't think he gave me the specs on it, but it's a, it's a Planet Ocean GMT. It has to be one of the best value for money watches out there. Uh, for what you're getting movement-wise, size, space, details. I love all the elements. We're going to talk about this now. I just want to get to the chat. Um, it's like a master compressor. Absolutely, Founder Times Capital. Um, you could watch first of the North Star, French TV in the 80s, Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> uh, you have 20 seconds to comply. Oh, man, I love Robocop. It was just something. And then they had to destroy it with, with the new reboots, whatever they did. It's funny how those reboots just disappear and you know it's it's alive for about a month and then the, the film just vanishes into obscurity the original robocop man i mean that first scene that was just when you got shot out of the window and it was just all of those those um, squeegees what do you call those i mean they don't make films like they did in the 80s you know okay so just taking another hit of the coffee and we're going to jump into this ceramic bezel turkey vulture yes it is absolutely I think the one, the one element that bothers me about the ceramic bezels on a lot of Omegas is that because they aren't uh, engraved, because there's no depth to them, you can lose them in the light. I've experienced this. I've worn a, uh, you know, the first ceramic Seamaster for a period of time. And I mean, in certain lights, it just disappears. Like right now, you can see a lot of these elements disappear. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's up to you. I think one of the unsung gems, Mr. Perpetual, you're in the chat. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, one of the unsung gems in this line is the black-white variant of this watch. So you have a black bezel and a white contrasting each other with a black dial. It's so striking. If you go into Google now and type in uh, Planet Ocean GMT black-white, I'm sure you'll see it. And I was really considering it, actually. I was taking a good look at the watch and the applied numerals of course orange hand uh, they really don't skimp out on the details just with, with every element applied applied numerals all over the dial batons sword hands easy to read um, also love that this hand is arranged very similarly to the second hand knurling on the bezel calls back to vintage pieces and i think it's just great liquid metal edition uh, that's something else and was that to do with the bezel if i'm not wrong um, but these are great. They're still available. They're still out, still out there. I don't know if they make a 39 mil variant of this watch, but they're all over the place. And when we just talk about the movements, I mean, coaxial, what can you say about it, you know? Okay, carrying on. Thank you for this, Mr. Perpetual, David. And this is from David Coffey, David C. I think he might be in the chat, don't know. And I think his, his uh, mail to me today was something like, trying not to be bluesy. Quite a nice play on words. And he's just rocking a two-tone, as you do. He loves this watch. He sent some great loom shots in a couple of weeks ago. And it's great seeing this watch in its natural habitat in the light. I think this will always be a timeless piece. I also think of this to be quite an important watch in the family because uh, when I just think back to my time as, as a youngster, I remember seeing a lot of fathers wearing these watches. And these fathers have handed them down to my friends in the past. And it's amazing. I mean, I think it's such a such a sentiment to have a watch like this, even though you know it's a submariner. It's it's supposed to be a heavy duty sports watch. I I commend the idea that what in the eighties they decided, hell, let's just try and blend these elements together, put some yellow gold in it, add the blue accents. It's very striking. We're talking about a one watch. I think this is a great contender for that reason. Of course, it's up to personal preference and taste. Uh, it's not for everyone. But uh, it's definitely not for me. I wouldn't be able to pull one of these off. But I can honestly say I, I commend the idea. I think it's, it's something I can really appreciate, this watch in particular. OK, so David, you're in, you're in the chat. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for sending this in. Good old two-tone, of course. Um, does it still have protection plastic on the crystal? 
I don't know. Probably not. No, I mean lighting. Lighting does all sorts of things. Remember that only the only the Cyclops has AR coating. Speaking of which, ladies and gentlemen, I'm putting a video out on Tuesday talking all about the Sea Dweller Forty Three and the Cyclops. I think you'll enjoy it. It's a bit of fun, a bit of humor around one element that Rolex doesn't want you to know about the Cyclops is on their Sea Dweller Forty Threes. <laughs> I'm blue, Dawadi, <laughs> that's funny, Tom. Okay, so great. Thank you for this, David. Next, now this is David from Las Vegas, and check how these two watches compare. He sent me a few of these, and let's have a good look at these for a second while I catch up with the chat, and uh, it's great. Again, if you'd like to reach me, tag me at IDGuy in the chat. I'm just going to refresh the laptop to see if I'm keeping up with everyone. Great, I think I am, kind of, sort of, sweet. Um, what do I think about it in ceramic, Troy says. You're asking me? Um, well, for, for my tastes, I prefer the five-digit reference. I think the presence uh, suits my wrist size better. The watches that I know that have been handed down to some of my friends, they are all the five-digit references. This one, oh, you know, I find the blue, I find this blue of the ceramic to be a lot more effective than the, the green on the Hulk. Can I say that? <laughs> I just did. Uh, the Hulk ceramic, to me, I think the green is just way too bright. I think this watch manages to ride a good line. And of course, the, the blue explosion on the dial as well, the beautiful sunburst is another thing. Uh, there are lots of things to like about this watch. The blue on the gold is also, I mean, this this color scheme we could assign to Batman, no? I mean, this could technically be the original Batman, couldn't it? Um, if you remember those colors back in the day. Yeah. I mean, talking about the ceramic watches, uh, Personally, I find that the ceramics are a bit too big for my tastes. I've tried on quite a few in the past, um, but that's just me. I've got a, a six and three quarter inch wrist since I haven't been going to the gym for a while. Uh, Lapis Lazuli, Reed, that's very well, well informed. Uh, sea Dweller is a monster. No, Speedy, it's going to be a good video talking about the Sea Dweller 43 and just how they've done the Cyclops lens. And it's, it's quite a funny story. Okay, moving on. If you guys could please comment on that point in the chat about ceramic and the blue, that would be great. Um, that's what's so nice about these, these comments is that there's lots of engagement between all of you as well. Okay, so we're getting into this. This is now from David. We've got an original Planet Ocean on the left and we have an Explorer. This looks like a, a 14270. Check out the, check out they sized, very different. I'd say this is also a 43 and this is 30, 36 as we would expect. But they did some great things with this piece. I mean, I would imagine this was the 2006 period with uh, the Casino Royale. I think there was some tie-up with that uh, that line. Um, but again, vintage-inspired motifs with all the elements on the dial. I think it's quite commendable seeing how they approached this watch. They made it to be the heavy-duty diver in the line. And really, when you look at this compared to the, the latest Seamaster Professionals, I think this watch is much more toned down in the way it presents itself. You know, um, it's by no means aggressive. It looks quite plain. And next to the Explorer, I think it's clear when you see them together just how plain this watch looks. This really does look like quite a professional instrument. Um, but next to the Explorer, I mean, it's an interesting contrast. Something about that 396, just the idea of numerals on the dial mixed with batons, it just gets me every time. I mean, for me, it is, that's what makes a terrific watch. I love that idea of the blend of those elements. And it's a good combo, as Hans says. Yeah, I mean, they are very similar. I mean, almost to the point uh, in all of the details. But it's great to see that these, these two watches are very emblematic. <clears throat> what am I saying? Emblematic of their brand. Uh, you know, the Explorer with its, with its case shape and styling. Uh, same with the Omega with its turned-in lugs. Uh, brings back calls to the... The original Seamaster 300 from you know the early 50s, but then also the, the MOD variants where their size has got increased and everything else. Okay, as we are getting through next, this is also from David, and this is a Grand Seiko GMT. This has become quite a hot favorite with its uh, fancy 9F quartz movement. Tanzil, thank you for tagging me. It's great, I can see it easier. Patek Philippe allowing retail retailers to sell online. London Jewelers in the US allows you to add new Pateks to cart. And is this something that you couldn't do back in the day, Tan? It'd be nice to hear some clarification. I mean, you know Patek more than most, so it'd be good to hear that story. 
Um, I know there's been lots of changes just in, in the consumer industry in general. Uh, online has just exploded. Like all of these platforms, YouTube, um, there, was, there was some details shared with the creator community is that uh, because of the increased traffic, YouTube tends to glitch out a lot with creator pages. I mean, my page just went haywire the other day when I was uploading the, the Smiths video. Now I can't post on the community page via the laptop, so I have to do it via my phone for a while. I don't know. You just have to go with the flow. At this time, everyone's online, as we can imagine. Hunger buster. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Perpetual. Okay. So Satan so says, no, Patek was only available in store. Watch Pro broke the news. Just tested it out in London Jewelers site. That's amazing. And I mean, can you imagine the sales they're going to have through that now? Um, I'm actually very surprised that they've never been a, a, a company to push online sales because, I mean, I just think of Omega as a brand by itself. Omega and what they do online with their stores. It's insane. I mean, you can literally get the watch sized to your wrist and sent to your door without even trying it on. It's, it's, it's amazing. Talk about customer service. And you can get NATO straps and everything with it as well. Um, I truly think more brands need to think about that in more detail. Anyway, getting into this. We know quite a lot about this watch, uh, 9F. <laughs> Talk about a Richard Mill. Yeah. GS aesthetics don't impress me much, Hans says. Um, I th was, was, that, was that me who said that? I don't know. I do want to uh, make another video on a Grand Seiko that I saw the other day. Also quartz, but it's an amazing looking watch. And down to the, the, the lugs and the styling, seriously cool. I really hope to bring it out soon. I've actually started the write-up. Let me just, I'll pull up my notes and give you the reference if you'd like to look it up. Uh, if, you're, if you're there, actually, I'll just drop it into the chat. Check out this reference on Google right now and tell me that I'm wrong. This is an amazing looking watch. I think it really manages to grab what Grand Seiko is doing. Uh, it's more of a sports watch than a dress watch, but does some cool stuff. Quartz from Grand Seiko is acceptable. They are incredible machines. And that's it, I think. You know, personally, for me, Quartz, I, I hate a tick on the dial like that. But in saying that, though, when you're dealing with a Quartz watch of this kind of accuracy and caliber, it's pretty nice. Um, if I was owning this watch, honestly, I would take that second hand off. That'd be the first thing. <laughs> I would remove that second hand. I don't need to see it ticking on the dial. Just as long as I know it works, that's fine for me. Um, but yeah, the GMT, I think the, the yellow hand does it more for me. I think that contrast between the black, if I'm not wrong, this has a, 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 blue, a blue iridescent dial. He's got it on a leather strap. And I think he sent another one. Here we go. Oops. So he's got a Meister Zinger, and he's got a, another shot of this watch. I uh, hope you can see it okay. It's a little bit blurry. But you get to see the in a low light condition, you get to see the blue on the dial. And this is on its bracelet. I don't know. It's, it's definitely Grand Seiko as a brand is one that, no, it ticks, Ashley. It doesn't glide, <laughs> sadly. Um, but Grand Seiko is definitely a brand on its own. And there are many reasons why. I actually talk about the reasons why the, the community is divided about the watch and the brand itself. The name is one thing. Uh, it definitely appeals to a certain person with regards to the, the styling and the details. Honestly, when I look at this watch, I think they could do, they could have done a lot more. Um, it's not, how do I say, it's not as refined as I would like it from a Grand Seiko family, you know? And this, and this Meisterzinger, of course, this is a single, single hand. So I, I would imagine, is it an hour only? It only covers the hours, right? You don't have, you don't have two handsets. It's great. I mean, it's, it's so unique and different. I need to look into this brand. There's, there's hundreds of others. <laughs> College, thank you. I'm the best. Uh, we'll see about that. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it, but you know, I do this for the love. And I think, I mean, I, I can't thank you all enough for being a part of the show. Uh, all of you who have submitted the watches in, who have engaged in the chats, this is really a community time when we get to see what everyone else is wearing. So David, thank you so much for this. And we've been running for what, 65 minutes at this point. Doing, <laughs> wow, I'm gonna have to speed up. I'm doing pretty well, but I'm gonna have to speed up with these. Dear Artifact, I hope you're in the chat, brother. But he's wearing a Junghans Max Bill. I think this is about 34 millimeters he mentioned. If you're on Instagram, follow Dear Artifact and let me just tag him in the chat. Uh, Artifact, hope I got that right. 
get onto Instagram, follow Dear Artifact, because his photography is terrific. He's got such a nice, simple set of watches to look at, and he has great taste. He has a blog. Uh, really check him out. There he is in the chat. Great. Um, so this was a gift from his parents. I'm trying to remember. This was a graduation gift. Uh, and check the suit that he's wearing. It just, I mean, it just works, you know? It just, it just has everything, ties it all in together. I think he had a great upshot. Here we go. It's another one. What I can do is I can just rotate the cap picture 180. And it's just, that's all. You know, Young Hans, Max Bill, that whole inspired Bauhaus motif. I think the one, the one element that everyone's drawn to is the four on the dial. That seems to be the, the part that everyone loves. Pencil hands. Now, it's crazy because I am an industrial designer. Technically, I should love, uh, I should love this, but simplistic nature of this kind really doesn't appeal to me. Uh, it's, it's funny. Bauhaus, generally Bauhaus watches that really try to stay true to the formula, they don't grab me as much as everything else. I've said this in a few videos before, actually, that the Bauhaus uh, motif has been translated through to everything that we see. So we look at something like, let me just pull up, hmm, uh, what's a good one? Planet Ocean. We were looking at a Planet Ocean a second ago. Just the Planet Ocean, that uses Bauhaus motifs, uses shapes and forms on its dial, still uses numerals. And I think just from any, any brand, the Submariner is probably a very clear, very clear inspired uh, watch that uses Bauhaus motifs, you know, shapes instead of numerals and everything else. But in saying that, this, this is quite the originator. This is a watch that gets a lot of people into the hobby for obvious reasons. I love the size. I think smaller watches, they need to return. I know many people don't like watches that are under 36 mils, but they look so classy. In a situation like this, when you're wearing a suit, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. You just want the face. You just want to be able to tell the time. I mean, what else do you need, you know? I would love for brands to be a bit more contemporary with their choices of sizes in the future. So thank you, dear Artifacts. Pleasure having you here, and thank you for sharing this with us. Um, again, on Instagram, follow him. Right, from Dylan. This is an SKX, <laughs> and he's washing a very happy, uh, this looks like a wire-haired Jack Russell. Could be wrong. Again, most of the time, I save these images and move on. Good watch for the chore, though, right? Um, he's wearing it on a Zulu. Seiko SKX, I mean, it's also another watch that just gets people into the hobby. And what can you say? I did a video about it well over a year ago saying, asking why it is so loved by the community. Then proceed to do a full um, history of the line and all of those details. Uh, wire hair. Two, uh, really, one, two, one, click bezel. I can actually see the watch is actually in your avatar. It's fantastic. A wire hair, Jack Russell. I love my dogs, so that's that's great. Maggie, Maggie the dog. So thank you for sending this in. It's always cool seeing the SKX. I think there's a few more, actually. And, uh, yeah, I have to motor through these because there's just so much on show still. Uh, this is from Eric Bell. And Eric Bell loves his dive watches. And uh, this is just one of his great loom shots. And I think there's a few guitars in the show, and there's some awesome guitars. This is a Seymour Duncan. Uh, it's a double. It's a double at the back. I recognize, oh, I recognize these, this bridge. What is this guitar? I have to know. Uh, someone can please clarify in the chat, maybe, if possible. As close to diving as I'll ever get. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> so this is cool. I mean, seeing the, seeing the watch under the UV light, you really get a good idea of how well it glows. Eric is huge when it comes to uh, dive watches in general. And uh, he has a huge collection, and he loves big sizes. This is a Gibson Mr. Perpetual. I also thought it was a Les Paul, just, just by the back. I didn't want to name drop unless I was wrong. But Seymour Duncan pickups and uh, exposed, not with the silver covers. He loves his Aragon watches. And this looks like a GMT. Of course, it's a GMT. Wake up, dude. You've only been doing this for an hour already. Okay, next from Eric. And I think this is the same Eric. No? Same difference? I don't know. This is also from Eric. And it's just, look how gorgeous this watch looks in this light. Wow. Okay, G-Shock. The reference is GX56BB, if anyone's interested. I love this watch in the lighting. You really get a good idea of the matte, you know, satin finish. You can't call it matte. It was either it was either a PRS or a, or a Gibson. I, have a f I had a feeling it could have been either or. I was, yeah, judging. I, once again, I scroll through. I don't even look at the watches half the time. Um, apocalypse watch exactly um, 
I, I really like the way the light hits this. And and Ron is saying, you, it's it's funny how coming again from a design point of view, speaking about the design of a watch, I, I do love the development and the story of this brand. I'd love to design my own G-Shock and have like a series running around that. But of course, it's not to everyone's tastes. I mean, it's a G-Shock. It's something you throw on, you use. Um, okay, so great. So many. How to send wrist shots, Amin asks. So uh, I normally have an email. If you, if you click on the uh, description of the video, you'll see my email at the bottom uh, under contact me. And uh, I'll be taking in submissions for two weeks' time. And every second week, we do wrist shot week, and we run through just a whole load of watches. So this is great. I also like seeing how well the LCD screen, would you call this an LCD screen? The display is so sharp. You don't even need to like worry about the lighting and everything. This is great. So thank you for this, Eric. It's always a pleasure. I hope you're still in the chat. You were here earlier. Okay, moving next. And the black on black look looks good, right? Yeah, dear right, fact, you're right. Are you watch guy? That's no, a pleasure. There's some amazing watches coming up. Don't go away because we're going to see some cool stuff. This is from Fauzi. Now, what I love about this man, his name is Tanku, but he, he likes being referred to as Fauzi. Um, he has a terrific collection. He has Daytona's Explorers. Uh, he's had all sorts. I think he's owned Patek's as well, but he can still enjoy a watch like a Hamilton. And uh, we've discussed his collection at length. There he is. He's in the chat. Awesome. Uh, we've discussed his collection at length. We try to. This isn't the Murph. This is just your standard uh, 38 mil Hamilton khaki. Um, and it's, it's really quite a character. Here's another example of him wearing it on a, on a NATO. But it's, it's great when, when an enthusiast, when, when a collector gets to wear a watch like this and enjoy it, but also enjoy the finer watches as well. Um, I think it says quite a lot about someone who owns it. Um, and it's just, I mean, it really is one of those field watches that is pretty timeless at this point, you know? Uh, it's, it's just loved. I think it's a hand wound. You can correct me in the chat. I think it's a hand wound piece. And I love the history of how Hamilton and the field watch was developed in the States and then in the UK for the Ministry of Defense and that whole development. I'd love to get my hands on a W, do they call it a, a W10 or a G10 Hamilton, that beautiful case. We've had it on the show. I think we had it on the show last week. Okay, so carrying on. Thank you, Fauzi, for these. Next is from Flippin' Zippo, and he should be in the chat too. Now, he didn't mention what the name of the watch is, so I guessed saying it was a speedy reduced, but I don't, you know, I, again, this is me grabbing the watch, throwing it in, giving it a name, moving on to the next one. Uh, but I love this, this radiant dial. So it's an automatic, and would this be at a time of a coaxial? I don't know. CWC is the G10. Thank you, too old for two wheels. Um, so it's a Speedmaster with a date. I don't know the reference. If you could highlight this in the chat, if Flip and Zippo is here, that would be cool. Um, but I just love that effect of that dial. Very interesting. I mean, you seldom see Speedmasters that have this layout. And I would imagine this was a uh, early 2000s piece, possibly, maybe. Speedy reduced. Yeah, it looks like it's about that size, right? Um, interesting looking watch. And there's a few Speedmasters. There's some great ones coming up in a second. And uh, yeah, I mean, who doesn't like a Speedmaster? It's amazing how this watch has trans translated through time and just how important it is as a collectible. Everyone just enjoys them because they're reliable, dependable, usable every day. So thank you, Flip and Zipper. And next, we're moving on to Freddie with a G-Shock. Now, Freddie, if you're in the chat, I think this is Freddie Turner. If you're here, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I thought this was such a nice setting and scene in the background. I think he said he was in Germany. I can't remember. Again, so many submissions, I, I lose track at times. But check the contrast here. This looks like one of the originals. This is what they call a tough solar. Me and G-Shocks. I don't know my stuff. So <laughs> uh, if you want to highlight a bit more detail. But it's nice seeing that yellow, yellow accent on the dial. This looks to be more of the original, more like the original that came out back in the day. I just love the setting. It's nice seeing a bit of outdoors since uh, most of us are locked in for the most part. Okay. So thank you for that, Freddie. We're moving through. We're now at G. So I'm just scrolling down. If you look on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm scrolling down to the next selection. We've got so many watches. Oh, my soul. So it's called a 5600. Is that it, Neo? Thank you. Yellow Mellow. Okay, so Glenn is next with an IWC bronze Spitfire. We don't see this watch in bronze often. 
So it's nice to highlight the watch on the channel. And I think we have featured Spitfire before on one of the shows. But uh, I really find that contrast something interesting, especially with the brown strap and everything else. The one, the one thing that I don't like about this watch in particular is that when it comes on a NATO strap, they are ex, you know, extremely expensive for what you're getting. And I would imagine on leather, it's a bit more understandable, but um, I do find the inspiration behind this watch interesting. Uh, you should, uh, I made a video about it as well, didn't I? Um, said something like a tribute to aviation and ran through the history of the field watch and where this, this piece takes its inspiration, uh, Philly's dad. I think I have your original name in the chat. You, you are there. Did I skip your watch? thought you saw the strap. I'll have to look. We're going to get through there eventually. If I did miss it, I do apologize. This is, uh, this is all just a hope and pray that everything comes through. It's like 130 watches up, and sometimes Mac does its thing. Anyway, so I like the fact that this watch takes its inspiration from field watches, a bit of pilot watch inspiration there. And uh, since this is a bronze, we're going to see it age quite gracefully over time. But uh, I wish you wish they kept left the date out. That's speedy pull. Very good point. Um, that's one element that divides opinion. I think this watch would have served itself better if it was a no date, since it's playing off the field watch aesthetic and just keeps that symmetry. I think in the video, when I talk about this watch, I do a redesign and I add a no date. And I do a few other things, like I add a red accent on the, on the second hand and things like that. It was a long time ago, so you can have a look. Tom Austin, are you off? I think Thomas Burnett just said, that take care. Thank you so much for joining, brother. Absolute pleasure having you here. Look after yourself. Take care. Um, so yeah, uh, talking about bronze, I've said this a few times. Uh, I like, I love the fact when a watch celebrates its material instead of uh, being a watch that you know has a PVD coating, for example. I think there's something very pure about a watch celebrating what material it's made from. But bronze, bronze I find so peculiar. I mean, the patina on bronze, unless you like the smell of rust, I wouldn't say you should go for bronze. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Uh, you'll be back in an hour. Well, well, we'll still be going by then, I'm sure. Okay, so this is from Glenn. Thank you so much for sending it in. Next, we have Hakuna Matata. Don't know, uh, don't know the username, but Hakuna Matata, thank you so much for sending this in. And... It's a monster. It's a Seiko monster. He didn't give me the name, so I'm just uh, I'm just riffing off what I remember. Seiko monster on quite a heavy duty. Uh, what would we call it? It's inspired by the uh, the paracord strap from Erica's originals and on those the French French military paracord strap. Um, nice contrast though. This this watch has quite a radiant dial, if I remember right. And there was talk about SKX being the winner. Um, I think it was from college. This is also, I find this to be quite a fascinating watch in the family because it really does speak monster in the way it presents itself. Um, okay, there was an also mentioned, not a fan of bronze. Yeah, Hans, I, I don't want to bat it, uh, bash it too much, but bronze definitely is a, is a peculiar material to use in a watch, considering just how it is going to rust and smell over time. <laughs> or white gold, as College says. Yeah, that's another thing. When you when you plate uh, a watch with white gold, that that process, what's the... Starts with an R, that element that they add. Um, okay, catching up with everyone else. Marine National, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Too old for two wheels. So cool looking watch. I like the I like the setting. It's nice seeing it in a bit of a focal blur area. It's a good fit too. So thank you, Hakuna Matata, for that. And there's another one that you sent me. Oh, geez, I remember this. So these are some citizens. Again, he didn't give me the names of the watches, so I just filed them under citizen. Very peculiar looking watches. I'm just having a look at this. Is this a solar panel? Someone can please highlight this to me. Is this a depth gauge or a solar panel or a speaker or an alarm? Please tell me. I'm dying to know. Um, Citizen in general falls into the same kind of line as Seiko. I think they're, they're a sister company, if I'm not wrong. It's a depth, depth gauge, Reed Cruikshank. Thank you for that. Yeah, I really I don't know much about these pieces, so I'm... Uh, Slowly but surely learning as we go. I'm just the I'm just the speaker. <laughs> uh, it's a camping cooker. <laughs> that's so funny, pilot style. If that's the truth, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't even. I mean, it does look like the, the top of one, right? I wouldn't even deny it. Like I really don't know, but it's I, I do like the idea of of digital and quartz together in one package, with a heavy duty NATO strap. 
also find the, the, the numeral layout on the dial quite interesting with this watch. And as we go through, so thank you for this, Hakuna Makatata. Thank you for sending these in. This is from Jim, and I think I might have made a mistake here. I'm going to jump to James with a Monta Triumph, which has, a, he calls it green. This is actually a green dial, but it looks like an amazing, amazing burst of brown in the finish. And I'm just catching up with all of you. Eject button, self-destruct button. <laughs> That's so funny. Thanks, everyone. Push to start, extract a fan. <laughs> this is what's great. When you have a community going, you can come up with the great remarks, and I just, I just mention them as we go. So apparently this is a green dial, but it looks very much like a, a whiskey brown to me, in this light at least. Um, and this watch has become quite the, uh, the darling on social media lately. Uh, I don't know what to say about them, really. I haven't had hands-on time with them. Um, and it's... <laughs> <laughs> and I knew Ron the Shrink would be there saying what he thinks about Monta. Yeah, I find it to be quite the, you know, the, the photo photograph darling on Instagram for the most part. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, are they ETAs? I, I really don't know much about the brand at all. But I do like that they've taken some elements and put them in the right place, like the date at the six, the, the different sizing of the hands. I noticed something quite funny about one of their models is that they I think it was a GMT hand, that has this huge U-bend to it. So it sits very low on the dial and has this U-bend. And I commented on Teddy Baldassar's uh, photo, basically saying, afterthought, question mark, because uh, use a Salita. Thank you, Chi-Town, Chi-Town. I'm getting your name right. I'm going to get your name right. Chi-Town, California. But uh, yeah, as a brand, I really don't know much about them, but it's becoming quite popular. Or should I say it is quite popular. It's a watch that the community seems to get when they're getting into watches. Don't know. It's all up for you. Okay, next. And this is from Jim. Where do we start with Jim? He's got a, he's got a stellar collection. Okay, let's start with his first watch. Uh, if Jim is in the chat, he will enjoy this. His first watch is, oops, Bauman Mercier Cape Land. I'm going to look at some great watches now. This was his first watch. He did give me a story about them, but these watches came in, his, his pictures came in like, 10 minutes before the show. <laughs> so I had to like quickly pull them together. I didn't, I didn't uh, look at the details, but I do know this was his first watch and he's been wearing it ever since. He loves wearing it. He's, I do remember him saying that he travels a lot. Therefore he, he takes these pieces with him. He travels a good few months in advance. So he doesn't have time to really keep up with his collection. So the watches that he wears, he generally wears for a long time before switching out. Um, <laughs> reader so I got shot on right yeah I'm learning I'm slowly but surely learning you repeated enough times what do they say practice makes perfection not perfect because you can practice and get it wrong but uh, you can be perfectly wrong in that sense <laughs> it looks like you could do some damage with it absolutely Hans uh, looks dated it does look quite old-fashioned I would say it looks kind of like that that early 2000s 90s era I would imagine um, don't know much about these watches at all, but you will see some great stuff coming up next. So let's jump to it. Next is his Planet Ocean Chronograph. And this is just cool. This is, he calls it his travel watch. He uses this when he's hopping all over the place. And I think as a travel watch, it's just so sleek, understated, hardcore. Um, the next watches that you're gonna see are pretty sweet. Okay, another hit of the coffee, slowing down catching up with all of you. So this is pretty heavy duty, right? This is a 45 mil. It's a diving chronograph, which is just badass. You can go to all the depths. You can time all the things. You've got a bezel to do the work. You've got a coaxial chronograph movement inside. Nice balance. Zombie apocalypse. I mean, this, this looks like quite the zombie apocalypse watch for sure. Uh, the helium release valve still baffles everyone. But I do like the fact that it doesn't look like a Reese's peanut butter cup. And actually, there's some symmetry between the knurling on the crown and the bezel, which is great. Um, and this is just a black on black, if I think. And I think he sent me another shot. So let's see if I can find it here. Uh, he sent me a great uh, photo in the dark. So we've got a bit of a loom shot as well. Yeah, it's just, it's just awesome. I really like it. I think as this heavy duty diving chronograph, run the shrink. He likes this. Run the Shrink has had a few of these in the past, if I remember right. Uh, 45 mils grown man watch. I think a lot of us could pull off a 45 mil, especially when it has a, a rubber strap. 
I think that integration is nice. It brings down, I mean, if I zoom out, you can see it fits his wrist great. It brings down the visual presence of the watch on the wrist. Um, let's see what the artifact says. I love it when Omega goes with straight lugs from time to time because as much as I love twisted lugs, they use it on too many models. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it has become their staple at this point in time, the, the professional, quote unquote, professional case. Um, okay, next up, and this is still from Jim. Are you ready? So this is his Royal Oak chronograph that he bought for himself for his 40th. And I mean, when you talk about a 40th birthday present to yourself, he says, this is going to be my greatest watch of all time. And I mean, who can blame him? It's just so cool. I'd love, and the next photo that you see of this watch is just mind blow. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, this piece is, oh, it's just, I, I love the colors. I think some Royal Oak chronographs do better than others when it comes to legibility and all of those details. Um, but I mean, it's, it's just something about this watch. I think it sits in, in around 41 and a half, 42 mils. Um, and there's a few, there's a few comments. There was a mention about a discord and everything. Um, I don't have one of those too old for two wheels. I'm bad enough as it is when it comes to social media. So I would be useless. I think I should create a discord channel one of these days, even though I don't have the faintest idea of what it is, <laughs> what it means. Um, but you know, just if you're on my Instagram, I've got about 50 DMs that I haven't answered and I probably will never get to because it's just too much. Um, I find that it's, it's hard enough managing an email and the channel with comments and everything else. Okay, just catching up with every, everyone here. Uh, Terminator watch. So it is really a nice blend of colors and contrast. And let's just get to the real money shot. Where is it here? Uh, Jim, I made a bit of a mistake with all the details. Oh, I hope I didn't lose it. Royal Oak Chrono 2, there it is. Oh, there we go. I mean, that is just, I wish I, wish I had this earlier so we could make this, because again, this came in, uh, I would say at least 20 minutes before the show started. It's beautiful. Uh, heavy duty, strange, peculiar, old school, modern, retro. He did mention in the in the comments, because I made a video, highly recommend you watch it. It was a, it was a great write-up. I, I titled it something like the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, love it or hate it, question mark. And I, I ride the fence talking about just how I love and hate the watch for many reasons. I can look at this watch now and say it is beautiful. But I wake up the next day, I look at it and go, why? You know, And I think that's the best thing about a design is when you can look at it every day and think, no, I like it. It's, it's like the perfect marriage. That's how I sum it up. Uh, brutalist design, number station, absolutely. Um, I think the perfect marriage is when you can wake up and say, oh, I hate you. And the next day, I love you. And it's that, that clash that really keeps you engaged with the piece. And this, to me, oh, I love the chronographs. I think the chronographs in this line especially really appealed to me the most. Just the use of space on the dial, the symmetry. I love that the date window is actually a part of the dial, so you, you lose it when you don't want to see it. Um, the blue on silver, I have never seen silver surrounds and then a different set of silver that's actually in the, in the middle of the, the subdials. It's beautiful, stunning watch. Love the, the contrast. The photo is terrific. So Jim, you got a winner here. And he sent me one more, a Hublot Classic Fusion, uh, Orlinsky black ceramic and apparently this is rare it was designed by an artist we all have our opinions about Hublot as a brand I'm sure you're all going to say something different about this piece but this was a watch that he picked up recently and he just he just liked it it's not it's not a watch I mean compared to the Royal Oak his words he 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 loves the Royal Oak with a passion that's his end all be all he got this watch just because it was something different and strange and he thought hey let's give it a try um yeah hublot hublot i should say it right um porthole as eric says uh but you know most of us know that hublot hublot as a brand has jean-claude beaver's dna all over it and i do like i do like the idea i mean this watch is made of ceramic full ceramic which is great i love that effect designed by an artist which is something interesting um, I like the effects that it has in a few places. I mean, we know that Jean-Claude Beaver loves his skeletonized dials. I think this is something to take into account. A simple white square in the background that allows for your stencil-styled uh, date wheel to rotate around. 
It's simple, effective, but also you get to see all that added technicality behind the scenes. It's not too skeletonized that you can't exactly, re, you know, you lose all the details on the dial. And let me pull up another one. He sent me another shot as well. And this was it in its casing, I think. I don't know. This was one of the last photos I saved for the show. So um, I just know that it was designed by an artist and his name is Orlinsky, black ceramic. I, I do what I do like of just the sheer amount of faceting on the edges. I mean, it's you get to see that here in this lighting. It's so sharp, really reminds me of if you know Tom Dixon. He is a product designer. He has a studio and agency. He's quite well known in the UK. Uh, he's quite big on these geometric forms with the way he arranges his furniture and lighting and everything else. This reminds me of Tom Dixon products in a way. Uh, not to be confused with Nixon products, <laughs> uh, Nixon watches, Tom Dixon, uh, and I'll, I'll type it in the chat for you to look at if you know, if you do know or don't know. And uh, I recognize these forms that he uses in a lot of his works, like chandeliers and everything else. It's very appealing for that reason, quite the sculpture. Okay, moving on. Thank you for these, Jim. These were terrific. And John, oh my goodness, John, look at this shot. This was sent in yesterday, I think. And I did say to him, if it wasn't for uh, Neil's original um, Explorer 2, oh dear, my chat is frozen. I hope, I hope that means that my laptop hasn't lost feed or something daft. Uh, let's have a look. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. It's still going. Good. Yeah, I'm having to refresh the chat ever so often. So it's good. We're in. I just, I, I love this photograph. It is just insane. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So it's a reference 116000, just the standard Oyster Perpetual Explorer dial layout with your traditional date just styled hands. I think it's a 30, it's a 36 mil size, right? Um, or was it 34? It's a 34, so 82, I would imagine. Okay, good. Uh, it's just great, radiant, nice color set. The lighting is terrific. If it wasn't for Neil's submission of the Explorer, um, Oh, Turkey Vulture, that's you. Ah, uh, yeah, well, well done. This is just, this is the business. Um, if it wasn't for Neil's submission of the first Explorer that is the cover photo for the show, this one would definitely take the cake. So Turkey Vulture, please send more of these in the future. I'd love to feature a watch like this on the cover. It's just so elegant. It's one of those watches that really does screen, it, it says Rolex, it doesn't scream Rolex. And I think that's elegant. Simple, plain, basic. Thank you for that. Next, this is from another John, and I love this. Uh, this is him wearing his, his Mark II, 214270, waiting for the show to start. And I thought it would be a nice, a nice feature to add. Uh, it's pretty cool seeing that, that inception, waiting for the show to start during the show, um, rocking the Explorer that everyone wants. I mean, it's just nuts. The, the community is going mad for this piece at this point in time. Um, Final Times Capital, love my APs. Yeah, it's great. I think, James, I think you might be catching up with the show or if maybe that's the case. We've, we've moved to, to Rolexes at this point. <laughs> um, but awesome. And how can you send a photo college? Look in the description of the video. You will see my email is, is linked there. And I'll be doing another wrist shot week, April, should be April 11th, eh? two weeks time. Um, but it's just, it's great. I love this a little bit of context. It's always nice to get a bit of a shout out. And what can you do? What can you say about this watch? We've already spoken about the Mark I already. Uh, it's just terrific. So thank you, John, for sending this in. Next, and this is from Justin. It's an IWC. Oops, Magic Mouse, work with me here, sweetheart. I hope I get this right. So this is an IWC Nova Cento. Please don't uh, crucify me. <laughs> but that's the, that's the name of this piece. And where do we ever see these watches? Again, this is from Justin. Um, Bud Owens, found my way here from my dining room. Hope everyone's well. Uh, are we on Z's or am I later than that? No, Bud Owens, we're sitting at J at the moment. And if I just, if you follow the left-hand side of the chat, you can see how many more names there still are to go. Oh my goodness, this is insane. This is going to be a long one, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but I hope I'm entertaining you. I hope you're enjoying the variety. It's going to get better. There's some amazing stuff still to come. So IWC Nova Cento. I would imagine it's an annual calendar, not, it's, oh, it's perpetual. Here we go. Check it out. Perpetual calendar. So it does it all for you. This is not just your simple everyday wearer. This one counts leap years and all of those details as well. And uh, beautiful. I mean, we've got, we've got German. This looks like German on the dial, all the layout. So this is a true German watch through and through. 
But I would imagine saying automatic, it would have a K behind it, no? I don't know. Swiss German, of course. Okay, so I'm sticking to this and getting back to the chat. I'm sure there's lots going on here at the moment. Um, Turkey, what is the reference, Ron? I, I did mention it was, uh, let me mention it again. It's a 116000. And uh, I'll put it in the chat, actually, Ron, if you're still in the chat at the moment. 116000. That's the piece. Okay, so uh, what's that top left on, on this dial, this watch here? Uh, this, I, I really don't know. You're right. I thought this was the date, but that's the date. I really don't know. Does that have to do with the, this could be the qu the quarter, you know, if we're in the second quarter of the year, maybe, possibly, maybe. I really don't know. You guys need to clarify it because I, I have no idea. Maybe it's leap year related. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's it. And it's probably because it's 2020. So it's uh, it's the 20 link to it. Thank you. It's very peculiar. But this it's strange looking watch all the way. I mean, this is really vintage inspired with all of its elements. It reminds me of that Hamilton we looked at. Was it Hamilton? No, it was a Bolivar at the beginning of the show. I can't remember. <laughs> okay, getting through. This is from Kem, and it's a Seiko. Uh, and I, for the life of me, did not write down the name. Is this a tuna? Is this a turtle? Is this a, I, I don't know. Uh, it's round. I would imagine it's a turtle, maybe. Beautiful photo, though. So let's, someone can answer the question on what this piece is. Um, <laughs> James, you're still catching up to kill a Hublot. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, yeah, we're rolling through. I can see you're a couple of minutes behind, catch about five minutes behind. It's great. Keep rolling through. There's some great watches on the show. Uh, let's have a look at what else is going here. I'm just catching up with all you. Baby Turtle, too old for two wheels. Thank you. I really don't know. Um, I, but I notice it does have that turtle aesthetic to it. And I do dig. It's nice seeing the Cyclops lens on this watch uh, since it's not your typical style. Interesting. Food for thought. Do you think... Um, do you think the Rolex Cyclops would look like this if they didn't decide to cut off the edges? Um, there's something about a simple dot on the dial that looks quite refined. On a, on, I'd imagine this is a strap code Jubilee bracelet with it. Um, Prospects as well. I mean, it's we've got a lot of Seikos. I was uh, surprised, just scrolling through very quickly before the show, I was surprised at just how many Seikos were sent into the show. It's It's a real love watch. Everyone seems to love it in the community, whether you're really into it or whether you've just started. Okay, so Kem, thank you so much for this. And we're going to go down to Kennedy for President. I love that name. Kennedy for President. Now, he was doing some electrician work in a jail, if I remember right. That was his, that was his title. And uh, yeah, so he's rocking a marathon, just your everyday marathon with a tritium dial. I need to do more discussions around these. Did mention this in the last show. It is Seiko Saturday. Read, absolutely. Um, the X is Prospects. Yes, it is, Flip and Zipper. And if you'd like to know a bit more detail about it, I love this detail. Uh, many people don't like the idea, but you see how it says P and how it says S uh, between the two parts. I find that a fascinating use of, of numerals, not numerals, of text on a dial. So from a distance, you see the X for Prospects. You zoom right in and you see the outline of the P and the S brilliant use. It has to be one of the best logos I've ever seen on a watch, and uh, that's saying something, you know. Seiko sold their soul, their luxury now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, lately, the, the Prospects watches have just gone ridiculous with uh, price lately. So this marathon, I mean, this is issued to military. I'd love to look at this watch in more detail in the future, discuss the thought of tritium still used on watches and all of that, which would be nice. Um, okay. Going to carry on through here. We're still rocking, and there's so many names still to go. I think we've almost hit our what's this number? Our number two. This is great. We're doing pretty well. Okay, so thank you very much, Kennedy, for present for your marathon. Next is Christian with an Oris Big Crown pointer date. I really don't know much about this watch at all. Is this? I don't irrationally hate the Prospects logo. That's <laughs> uh, funny. Okay, so let's. Check this out. I really don't know anything about this piece. The the big crown pointed date. It seems to be quite popular. There was there's been lots of talk about it in bronze and being featured all over the show. Um, but yeah, I mean, are they paying tribute to a watch that they have used in the past? Is this is this a piece that has been a navigate you know a navigator's watch? Has this been used in aviation in history? I really don't know. Um, 
so Christian sent this in. I don't know if this is just the standard. I'd imagine this is just the standard stainless steel. It uses cathedral hands, very traditional. One element that I love about any dress watch is that it implements ideas like extra hands for date complications. It's nice to see the dial cluttered with details. Uh, honest Oris, exactly. <laughs> um, Chaitan says, I've handled that Oris before. It's a lovely watch. And I don't know if it's a blue dial, Reed. Very well spotted. I don't know if it is. It might be black. Uh, there's no, there was no mention about the reference number, I don't think. With a big, um, the big crown, it has an almost onion aesthetic. I do really like the way they've turned the bezel. It's nice seeing that knurling around it. it gives off that vintage inspired element. And I think more bezels need to be toned down in pieces for the most part nowadays. Okay, let's carry on. Shaitan says it's a faded blue gray. Awesome. Okay, next, this is from Chrono Craze, and it's a Hamilton Intramatic. I love this photo. It is gorgeous. On nice textured jeans or corduroy, whatever that is. Um, this is a really beautiful picture. Look at that. That's a wallpaper worthy shot. No? Gorgeous. And not a fan of cathedral hands, Hans. Yeah, I agree. I think the cathedral hands are, they work on certain pieces for sure. And Julian's asking, did I get your photos? If you sent them in for the show, uh, I'm sure I did. I, I, I must have missed them. Oh, geez. I must have missed them, if that's the case. If we're now on to K. Um, but I do remember seeing your email. So if I hadn't saved them, then I do apologize. Uh, please, by all means, Julian, can you send them again for the following week? And I will for sure cover them and save them as much as possible. Um, so talking about cathedral hands, they, they look dated. They look, I don't, it depends on the watch, I think. On some, they look pretty good. I think on the Alpinist, it does quite a nice job of splitting up the piece. And this Hamilton Intramatic, I don't know the history of this. Is this a watch that was made in the 60s and translated through? It's another brand that I need to discover over time. But the, the highlights and the contrast, I mean, it's a seriously legible looking watch. And I love the, the heavy duty NATO that he's using on this. Uh, it really contrasts with the, the, the dial and all the details, the relationship between the elements. It's also nice seeing pencil styled hands and the much more you know, traditional approach to, to details. And then there's another example, him wearing it on the wrist. Now, whether or not the lugs are too long and everything else, that is, the pushes do look like they stick out a lot, saying you're right. Um, that's up to opinion whether you like it or not. If you wear a watch on your right wrist, then you could be okay. But um, I don't know how anyone can wear a watch on their left wrist and, you know, be so, you have to be really careful with those details because, I mean, you can snag that on anything and could cause some damage, you know. Uh, and Chip, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining, and I'm glad you're enjoying the discussion. This is what we do. Uh, if anyone is new to this show, it's simply a time when you submit your watches in, and we just have a broad discussion on all the pieces on show, and some of the watches are just incredible. As we keep going through, there's some beautiful Speedmasters, Datejusts, Grand Seikos coming up, uh, another Zenith, just checking out what else, some Explorers, Zins. Okay. Carrying on. Love the contrast. I also think the, the white hand is great on this piece as well. Nice. And there was a mention about military look. Does very much look like a military piece for sure. Financially responsible man, Daytona, Turkey Vulture. <laughs> it's funny. Sans date. Yeah, it's another point of attention. Now, I really hope that Les. Oh, God, this is awesome. Okay, so Les sent me a couple of things. He sent me three watches he was wearing. And then I hope this is his wife's. It's just, oops. Oh, no. What is going on here? Oh dear, the screen is, is glitching out on me here. That is not good. I don't know why it's zooming in like that. Oh dear, oh dear. So his wife had a mini sub. We're going to talk about these guitars in a second. His wife had a mini sub and it looks like I must have dragged it across and made a mistake. So sadly, Les, if that is your wife's watch, it won't be shown, <laughs> but your watches are here. So we've got a, a tag, a tag Monaco. This isn't the, the recreation of the Hoya Monaco, but I saw these watches. I, I saw the guitars on display and I thought to myself, what, <laughs> how many do you have in, I mean, so I was trying to you know, look through and really Les, could you please send us photos of your guitars in more detail? So this is a Les Paul, Fire. I thought it was a Gretsch, but this is a Les uh, Gibson Firebird, as, as Eric says. Can't make out what this is, but I think that that scratch guard, pick guard, could be something. This is an SG. Uh, looks like there might be a Strat there. This could be a PRS. 
Looks like we got a black strat and we've got a gold top as well. So let's get to the next piece. This is his speed. Look how many guitars this man has. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, Speedmaster Professional, just your standard. He loves this watch. But look at these guitars. Of his. We've got a gold top in the corner here. And, and I don't know, he's shared a couple of his guitars in the past. This man has taste. He's got some awesome, I mean, hell, this is a dream for me. This is also a Firebird, no? I'm pretty sure this is a Gibson Firebird with its, uh, its beautiful form factor. Um, he also has an ES-335 that we saw. I'm pretty sure guitar is used as a wallpaper. That's so funny, Zane. Um, I'm pretty sure last week, or the last show we had, he had all Beatles guitars on display. He had a J200 Gibson. He had uh, a 335 Casino. Um, he had a, what else? It was amazing. He had a Harrison Strat. He had a fretless bass, Paul McCartney's violin fretless bass. Um, Dan Armstrong, I don't know. You know, it's been a while since I've been in the guitar game. I've, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge Strat fan and I rebuilt mine. And since then I haven't even looked at another guitar, which is nuts. Beatles, truth fears, <laughs> hit bugs. Yeah, not not those Beatles. Yeah, but this is awesome. I think the, the the guitars are what really catch our attention. So Les, next time, please, please share more photos of your guitars because I'm just I, I love seeing guitars on a wall. Um, and Ron says I feel there's no point in playing guitar unless you're really good at it. And you know the the best the best lesson I ever learned is another shot of his tuxedo. Oh, jeez. Move to the next wall. This is a tuxedo dial date, date just, but just look at the guitars. Uh, looks like we've got a Stevie Ray Vaughan. <laughs> it just goes on and on and on. Looks like we've got some more retro pieces. Oh, geez, you've got to, you've got to highlight these pieces in, in more detail in the future. One thing I've learned about guitar, which I think is invaluable, one of the best lessons I learned. My first guitar was a Martin. Spent a lot of money and bought one. And if you want to get good at guitar and you really want to play guitar, you have to get an expensive guitar because they, 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 they're so much easier to play. The more expensive they are, the better they're set up. And therefore, the more easier they are to play and they are just generally more enjoyable to play. And I think that's something you should take into account. There's nothing worse than buying a guitar for like $200 and then after a, a couple of weeks, you're sick of it because you just can't get the hang of it. Fret buzz and all of that. I love this. This looks like a proper custom shop, SRV, Stevie Ray Vaughan. It looks like it's been relicked to absolute hell, scratched up. And <laughs> I mean, I'm not so much of a fan of the relic series. Buy once, cry once, shy town, absolutely. Buy an expensive guitar, learn it, love it, enjoy it. There's your wife's mini sub. <laughs> it showed up. <laughs> so uh, I hope this is your wife's mini sub. What a beautiful watch, no? I think I think it's just... It's amazing. 36 mils in and around that area. The mini sub, they are extremely expensive nowadays in the, on the gray market. And I love this contrast. I mean, for a woman, actually, even a man, it, it looks great. Two-tone, uh, beautiful contrast, nice balance. And when we talk about Tudor subs, I think the idea of those triangles on the, on the dial really completes it. It would be nice to see a Tudor sub again, incorporating this, this kind of aesthetic. So I think for a woman's wrist, Mini sub is pretty nice. Uh, does that rule for guitars apply for watches? BS. I think it's. I think there is a bit of difference uh, there. When it comes to guitars, I don't think there is this parabola drop off effect. Great question. And let's just talk about this date just for a second. We haven't. <laughs> we haven't been hanging on it for a while. Um, the when it comes to watches, there is a parabola where you get to a point when the price of the watch is quite debatable and you're buying into the brand more than anything else. But with guitars, I mean, you want the best sound, you have to get the best equipment. I mean, it's just fact. Uh, when it comes to acoustics, you want the best sound, you have to get the best made bridging, bracing, uh, best made woods. An older guitar will sound better, warmer, richer. So no, I don't think it lines up the same way, but uh, yeah, guitars are amazing things. And uh, yeah, I started, I taught myself in about 2012, I got into it. And I love it. I, I learned lots of Neil Young. Neil Young was my starting point, learning how to pick that way. Um, love Hendrix. Hendrix was always just, I mean, he's just the most mad. It's, it's amazing how timeless guitar players can be. And Hendrix is one of those souls that came and went and just shook up the world of guitar, you know? Okay, so I love this. Also, talking about the date, just, I love the, the tuxedo. 
I think it's really that Monte Carlo watch. Uh, Koa wood also, yeah, they're beautiful. Um, I, I love the contrast of the, the clash of the dial. And there's a couple of these. There's a couple of casino variants that you get nowadays. Awesome. Les, you're in the chat. Fantastic. Please highlight your guitars in more detail in the future because it's just insane. I've never seen so many guitars in one place, in one house. And uh, if my ideal man cave would be, you know, walls filled with watches on one side and then, you know, walls filled with guitars the other. Great setup, by the way. Like the fact that you've staggered the guitars on the wall. Oh, nuts. So thank you, Les. This is from Marcello, and this is this is a great story. Ties into what I've done in the past too. So we'll get to that now. Um, Slash is the man for sure, for sure. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Lots of money on the wall, absolutely, Hans. I mean, their guitars are by no means cheap, but uh, you know, you, you buy once, cry once, for sure, with guitars, and they last you forever. I mean, they they are amazing objects. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed them over my last few years. I think I've told you all the story. Uh, what one to one click bezel? I have fourteen acoustics, two Mossmans, Ovations. I love Ovations. Uh, Martin kits. Mossmans are the longer of acoustics. I, I really think that Martin, for, for my taste at least, I think Martin is the longer of acoustic guitars. Um, Ovation also has quite a nice standing too. This is a beautiful Grand Seiko. Just for just for your reference, it's a reference S. BGR301. And we'll get to this watch in a second. Um, just talking about uh, guitars. Yeah, I mean, there's so many. We have Taylor, we have Martin. Martin for me is, is a guitar that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we have Gibson Hummingbirds and all of those too. Guitar photos with watches. That's a good idea, Jerry. All of you submit your watches with guitars. I mean, I'll do it. I'll send it with my... Uh, my Stratocaster American special that I did my own custom shop job to it. Just nuts. The details are insane. I'd love to actually show you all. Okay. So this Grand Seiko, Marcello, bought this watch. He's an industrial. How's, how crazy is this? Okay. Uh, he's an industrial design student. And here's a better shot. Look at this. Hold on a second. I mean, that is just, that is just amazing. You can tell this guy's a designer, right? He's an industrial design student. I'd imagine he's based in Italy. He bought this watch as an award or as a reward for himself. And he won the award as uh, for a lighting competition. He designed a light and he obviously came first place. And uh, funnily enough, I also have won a lighting design award in the past. Pretty cool how you get an industrial design student, very similar situation. This is an awesome reward for yourself. And, uh, no date. He mentions no date being quite special. I mean, you don't see these watches around. Again, it's the reference SBGR301. And it really does look complete. Um, it epitomizes Grand Seiko in, in the way, you know? Uh, very nice and clear. Beautiful handset. And this is this is similar to the watch that I'm going to be talking about in a, in a new video coming out soon. Um, just with regards to the dial and the numeral placement, all of those details. So thank you, Marcello, for sending this in. Congratulations. And I think as a reward for an, an award, um, can't get better. It's a beautiful watch. For a designer especially, I really like that. Okay. Mark with an Air King. Starting off strong with the Air King Precision. This is a beautiful reference. I'm going to get to that now. Steinway and Sons. When we talk about pianos, yeah, sure, for sure. Okay, Telly Next, 335s. It's just chat about guitars. There was a mention about uh, dogs, dogs and watches. You know, the, the sad thing is I lost both my girls like two years ago. I had two beautiful golden retrievers, lost them both. So I would be missing out on that, which would, that's the reason I would love to feature dogs and watches, but I don't have any dogs at the moment. And uh, yeah, 2018 was a hard, hard year. I'll tell you that much. Uh, from personal experience, it was probably one of the worst years of my life. <laughs> in many respects uh but yeah catching up with all of you here very neat aching this is a beautiful watch uh, this this exact watch i think was featured in what is the name of that movie a cure for wellness um by by del toro guillermo del toro i think he he, he made the film it's a weird you know you know his films are just nuts but this watch is quite prominent in the film worn by that guy what's his name Dane DeHaan, 
a cure for wellness wellness it's a weird movie i watch it for the watch because he wears this and and rocks it a couple of times you get to see some good shots of the piece um but this this model i think is really is quite the unsung piece in all respects you look at the dial beautiful classic layout pencil hands uh, it's so neat uh, the contrast between the black on the on the batons and placement the air king is quite the unsung hero in the family and yeah it should get a revival i think you know yeah flip and zipper is not good it really wasn't a nice year and it's it's never good losing i mean my two girls were 13 years old and uh stepsisters they they passed i think a month apart it was horrible but uh they had the best life i mean they grew up in south africa they had all the open space they came to england and they got to experience snow and they, they really had a well-rounded life for sure. I mean, they're spoiled, spoiled rotten as dogs. Um, so as we're going through, Air King, beautiful, classic, timeless. I think it is quite the unsung hero. I mean, these watches were designed for RAF pilots, you know? Uh, anyway, moving through, I think this is also from Mark. And this is an IWC Mark 15. Uh, I, can't, I don't know if it's the same Mark or not, but this is also a Spitfire check it out it's got it's got a beautiful sword hand on the hour uh, very cartoonish style big loom plots let's move this around have we ever seen a spitfire like this before don't know amazing no date and that's what matters the most look at the chapter ring the, the beautiful rail minute track running around the outside uh classic you know modern vintage classic and it looks like an ace ace of is it a heart or ace of spades, would you say? Um, so this is this is very much a play on your cathedral handset, wouldn't you say? Uh, they've taken inspiration. It looks like the, the minute hand is more true to form. It even looks like the second hand is loomed as well. Fascinating watch. Never seen this before. Honestly, because I'm scrolling through these so fast, I do miss a lot of the details. So uh, IWC overrated. Um, overrated, not underrated, Brandon. Interesting. Once you see, once you see the sack, you cannot unsee it. I don't know what you're referring to there, but I, I, I don't think I, uh, I want to. <laughs> okay, moving on. This is also from Mark, and I don't know if this is the same Mark. There were a few marks. This is a Zin 356 UTC. Now this is a special watch because it runs a Velju 7750. Apparently, they were quite limited edition and uh, pretty important for the most part because they were made in small numbers. And as uh, I think Ron the Shrink mentioned, that Zin is what IWC should be, um, all of those details. Uh, you, you should see Zing, uh, Yingwei Malmsteen's All Gold Datejust Collection. I feel like there was a Yingwei Strat on the wall as well. This Les has everything by the looks of things. <laughs> I think Les should just feature his guitar collection for the show, you know. And I think it is titanium hoplite, absolutely. Uh, brushed finish, no polish. This absolutely looks like a titanium finish on the piece. Beautiful. Uh, high contrast you very seldomly see this this kind of highlight on a dial utc i mean this is really a, a military inspired piece flieger chronograph value important interesting combination thoughts on zinn bracelets and i it's one of the elements that i really appreciate i find it to be such an interesting uh, combination of elements modern and retro uh, i would say more in the line of modern very integrated streamlined I, I like the fact that it seems uh simple on first impressions it doesn't scream out about itself and that is when we talk about german design in general a watch should not scream and i think this bracelet does a good job at being restrained but also very functional i'm sure it's so articulate as well um so zinn keeps the operator in mind hoplite yeah i agree i mean this this does look like an instrument cluster and look how legible it is one thing about zinn let me try and rotate it one thing about Zinn is that they really understand how to use line weight and contrast on their dials. And you can just see that, oops, you can see that in full effect here. I don't want to use that magic mouse effect. You really see just how they use the colors and the highlights and the contrast between all the different plots, the numeral placement and setting, just great. So Mark, thank you for sending this. And I don't know if this is the same, this is a different Mark. I don't know, lots of Marks. Uh, we've got another El Primero. This is a different Mark who sent this in, pretty sure. 
He sent in a whole load of El Primeros last week. And we have another one. I think this is the fourth El Primero we've had so far. <laughs> it's just nuts. I mean, uh, Mark, Mark, they all have Ks as well. Mark with a K. So it's very difficult to know who's who. I should just add their surname in as well. I should add a, a you know, first initial of their surname. Hitting the coffee. I love that balance. I uh, love that date window. Nice setting. Peculiar looking El Primero. And I think Mark sent another one in. He did. So this is the same Mark in this section. <laughs> Zenith heaven. <laughs> Lots of Zeniths. El Primero owners coming out of the woodwork. Neil, abs Neil, absolutely. This is the same Mark with a speedy broad arrow. We're going to have a look at some cool broad arrows in a second, by the way. Um, so this piece, I don't know what it was really. It was trying to be commemorative in a way to the original 57. Uh, it uses a few elements like uh, steel bezel, uh, but it does use curved lugs. So it has a quite a good blend. It's also automatic. So I would imagine it's a coaxial. Um, nice highlights, um, lots of detail. I'm going to get back to that Zenith now. And these hour markers, they look like they have a single, if I zoom right in, looks like it has a single piece of loom, only half, half a loom plot on each baton, which is interesting. And these are all heat blued. I think he did specify every single element that you see that's dark is actually heat blued. And uh, yeah, what can you say about the broad arrow? I mean, it's a classic and so legible, you know? Okay, I'm going to get back to that Zenith quickly because I didn't spend enough time on it. Uh, where is it? Here it is. There is a ton of detail, as mentioned, on this dial. Uh, we look at the inside, the inset, all the different finishes, the polishing. I also think the Roman numerals were executed very well with this. You see just a great amount of balance between the elements. Um, again, it's it's definitely very dress focused. Tetley, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you all for joining. I don't know how long we've been going for, about 113 minutes or so. Let me just refresh the stream and see. Doing pretty well. We're doing pretty well. Um, Lots of gilouchette, <laughs> exactly, gilouchet, gilouchette. Uh, yeah, we've had so many zeniths, it's just nuts. I can't believe it. So thank you very much, Mark, for sending this in. And then we're moving to uh, Martin. And this is this is Philly's, Philly's dad. Martin and Philly the dog, Philly the boxer. Um, and this is a Seiko King turtle with a olive dial. I really like this combination. I think Philly's, uh, Philly's dad is still in the chat. So we've got a beautiful olive drab finish with orange highlights and accents. Uh, this watch is quite the, uh, it, I, I find of all the Seiko models that are recently, I think this especially is one of the best they make. Bull Mastiff. I think there's a better photo in a second. Anyway, so saying uh, the, the 6105 is the piece that really started, really pushed Seiko into this, this ballpark, this category. And I think this watch does a great job at being the one that helps define that era, that period, you know? Um, let's carry on with Martin. He does have another, he has another photo with, there we go, definitely a boxer, not a bull mastiff. I hope, I'm hoping I'm getting this right. Uh, but look at the contrast on the dial and the, the beautiful setting. This reminds me of a, of a Patek Aconaut in a way. Um, Nice detail. We're going to get to the, the pup again in a second uh, with a rubber strap, which is great. Nice, very nice shot. Love the setting. We've had a lot of Seikos. It really is a Seiko Saturday. Um, great blend of details. And then we zoom in. You can see, got a wrist shot going on here. Oh, it's just precious. Got to love our dogs. Dogs really. One, one of the best statements I've ever read in the past is that it's a dog. A dog is an animal. The only real creature on this earth that Comp that uh, loves you more than it does itself. And I think that's true, very true. Grenade dial, as said by Dear Artifact, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's just, just stellar. And I think this watch really does epitomize Seiko as a dive watch. Uh, 6105 cubes all the way through it. Compared to the Samurais and the and the tuners and all of those, I think this one is is the winner for me. If I had to pick up a Seiko diver, I'd be picking up one of these. Uh, just the standard turtle instead of an SKX, for example. Anyway, uh, we finished with Mark, and now we're jumping to Michael with a date just 41. Michael has some cool pieces that we're going to be seeing now. So this is him wearing, I think he might be at a boutique wearing this. Yeah, Reed, 
Absolutely. Dogs. Dogs are great. <laughs> so now we're jumping to a date just 41 from Michael. I think the next shot we get a better idea of it in the setting. There we go. What do you think of the champagne dial and all of those details? What I do like is that it's it's more sports oriented than your, your generics. Uh, it doesn't have a fluted bezel. It's quite understated in the way it's presented. Um, but then again, the dial is quite flashy and sil silver dialed. Yes, that's a better way of saying it, Triton. Uh, silver dialed OP, not uh, not OP, date just. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it champagne, so to speak. But it's just, I, I do also like, I like the batons. I think it really completes all the elements. Uh, when we look at the oyster bracelet mixed with a, with a flat bezel, the uh, the batons on this dial also adds to that level of simplicity. And the date just with its big, big cyclops, I think that also just adds a little bit of depth to the watch. We know the date just is the watch that originated the whole idea of a rotating date window. And I think of all the watches in, in the Rolex line, if any watch deserves a cyclops, I think this one does just to emphasize that detail. Okay, slowly but surely getting through. There's all sorts of talk about date justs and everything else. It's great. So this is also from Michael, and it's a Seamaster. We never see these watches, and it's so cool having it on the show. Uh, Seamaster 300, 1957 reissue. These are hidden gems, ladies and gentlemen. Um, really nice to see it. And look at that presence. And you got it in some great lighting as well. So uh, you guys have a good browse through this. What do you think of this piece? As a, as a reissue, I find that's one thing about Omega that I find really commendable. They don't sleep when it comes to reissue watches. I think they are so good at being able to, I mean, this one really did do something important was, uh, it was one of the first that really had that CT scan effect, you know, that's been translated through all sorts of pieces ever since. Uh, they, they scaled and, and sized this watch one-to-one -to, -one to the original 57. He's got some beautiful photos of it as we go through. Uh, where's another shot? Let's see. It's got three in. So this is in a bit of an off light. And you can see that the numerals stand out really well. Nice broad arrow. The Explorer-esque dial. Yeah, I agree. It's a really nice thin bezel. So the elements about this watch that really does speak to the enthusiast in me. Um, so let's see. And something says the Trilogy 57 series are great, but people overlook how nice the bracelets are on the series. And that's another detail. As far as I know, these bracelets are entirely unique to this family. I mean, they really nailed it with all the details. Uh, the, the links are smaller than the standard 300. Um, polishing on the outside and brushed on the center. It's, and the size as well, 30, 38 and a half mils, not, not 39. It's a little bit smaller. Um, the bracelet width is about 18.6. It doesn't have a taper, but just look at it. I mean, it has, it's, it's so understated and has a great presence. So in off light, you get to see just the beautiful broad arrow. And then we get down to a bit more of a direct light. Of course, with all the, with all the polishing, it is quite the fingerprint magnet. But uh, it's an interesting watch, it really is. These are going for a lot of money on the market nowadays. Um, it's crazy. They're actually retailing for about the same as uh, watch. No, so they're retailing for the same as you can get them on the gray, the gray market. So uh, Neil says, wishing the Trilogy braces were brushed all the way through. There is something about what I like about this in particular, instead of having polished in the center, is that the brush, the polishing on the outside allows it for it to like visually look a bit slimmer on the wrist. Oh, it's a cool looking piece. And there was another mention talking about the clasp. I don't know, you'll have to, I'd have to see it in more detail. But as far as I know, the clasp is is quite short. They've they did a lot of good things with this piece. Um, and there's a, you won't believe it. How's this for something? Um, just in this show alone, we're going to be seeing the Broad Arrow Speedmaster 57 and this watch, one show. Two guys, two completely different guys. Um, yeah, I mean, just look at the details. They did a great job with this piece. Anyway, carrying on. Grail Master, truth fears, that's funny. Lugs are really long. They do look like they stick out quite a bit. But uh, it's that presence. I think it has a, a nice amount of presence. It's subtle. It's understated. It's so good seeing this piece on the show because this this watch, I think of all the models we've seen in the family. I've been like this watch has been on my radar for sure. I've been looking at this piece, and uh, of all the watches we've been seeing, this one stood out to me a lot for many reasons. Mainly because we just don't see them at all. 
they never featured they aren't shown if you're on instagram and social media you see them a lot but otherwise um they're just superb so the whole trilogy set is great and i love this this darker shot and then we jump through to here we see it in more uh lamp lit scenario just great okay moving through this is also from this is from another michael so many michaels uh my magic mouse is really acting up on me i, I really need to download the uh the uh, adobe preview because this is just getting irritating at times okay let's get through so i just want to say hi to some of you what you've been mentioning uh talking about clasp size okay uh all omega flip and zipper yeah, absolutely too much for me so this is this is a extremely peculiar watch in the grand seiko line but i do love the story and it's a beautiful photo from michael so thank you for sending this this is a grand seiko gtr and it was brought out in tandem with the, the nissan gtr and they've they've used inspiration like or if you can call it the datsun i mean this is much more of a datsun inspired or a very old school Nissan inspired dial design. And they've used some of those elements in their you know, instrument cluster layout. Um, love the texture. This is all ceramic. It's a ceramic watch and it's very hardcore. Let's say that much. Um, don't know so much about the white on white. That's all up to opinion. But as far as Grand Seiko goes, I mean, it's a spring drive. You have a power reserve at the base here, which is interesting. Beautiful texture on the dial as well. I'm sure we can all see that. Um, Peculiar. I remember this watch was released quite recently. Actually, it's not it's not old by any means, um, and they came in a few colors. I think you get some in black, some with red, and all of those details. Too busy, like the car. Way too much going for me. I don't. Yeah, it is. It is very technical for sure. It does have that technical effect. And if I'm not wrong, this looks like a GMT as well. Just having a look at that that hand, it does look like. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's to do with a chronograph. I don't know. Really nice seeing it, though. And the photo is, is beautiful. I, I think the lighting, getting that under lighting as well, just picks up all the little details we want to see. And then we move through. This is also from Michael. This is another Michael. <laughs> uh, Zin UTC 856 S UTC. That's the reference. And again, I mean, Zin, we know how Zin approaches their details. Thorsley, welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Um, so this piece, again, has that, that similar effect we were talking about when we look at Zinn with their, their contrast and their dials, uh, just the sheer amount of understanding when it comes to line weights and all of those details. Um, I don't know how effective this numeral layout is compared to others that we've seen in the past. Still, great looking watch. Love the balance and the symmetry. And yeah, I think there's another one. Same watch. What is this? This is a smartwatch. So he mentions this in again and adds the smartwatch in the corner. I have absolutely no idea what this gadget is. Um, <laughs> see, I worked at a company once where 45% of their staff was named Michael. That's so funny and something. Yeah, but there were a few Michaels, quite a few Michaels featured. And there's a couple of, there's a mic as well coming up in a second. <laughs> um, crazy looking contrast. I mean, this, the smartwatch that we're in nowadays uh this this world that we've arrived into it's uh it's a peculiar one right and it, it questions a lot of things about us as enthusiasts and what we should like what we shouldn't like uh whether the designs are good or bad or what appeals what doesn't great looking pieces though and just scrolling down we've still got quite a lot to go oh my goodness i'm gonna be gradual we've been going on for now what almost two and a half hours at this point i'm gonna try and pace myself over the next half an hour period. We'll see what we can do. I hope you can all hear me fine and it's all still going great. So Michael, thank you for sending this in. And then this is from Mike and it's a Seamaster GMT. This one is pretty interesting. So it uses the 2254 layout and details except GMT with a silver GMT bezel, sword hands. Uh, interesting contrast on the dial with the black and white. Flip and zipper, you can still hear me. That's good. That's great. Um, holding out for Zane's watches. Hans, there's one watch from Zane, and it's really nice. It's, it's He says, if I only wanted one watch, that would be it for me. So it's really good. And there's still, when we get to R and we get to Russell, I think there's quite the mic drop coming up in a second. So uh, just a few more. Just, I'd say another another 10 or 15. 
you'll get to Russell and then you'll be impressed. Okay. So let's talk about the bezel font. I think the font on the bezel is a bit uh, cartoonish in a way. It would have been nice to see it a little bit more uh, toned down, less heavy duty. But in saying that, I think the contrast is quite nice on the dial. It's nice seeing this. Once again, one element that I mentioned about the, the great white Seamaster is if they could just fatten up those, those outlines on the batons, that would be good. Great looking watch overall. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Those are some guitars in the corner there. Whoa, hold on. We've got an SG by the looks of things. We've got a Marshall amplifier over here. This looks like, what? This is a V. It's a flying V. Gibson flying V. And this is a Firebird. No? Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, let me know. So we've got an SG, got a flying V, and a Firebird. Hummingbird fire. I, I've been out of guitars for so long, so you might want to clarify that. Awesome, though. Didn't even notice these pe the guitars in the back. And a Marshall, very Lani Marshall amp. Doesn't have a helium release valve, as mentioned by, by Mr. Perpetual. Does that mean then that he's taken it off? Did this watch ever, ever come with a helium release valve? I have no idea. So please clarify that as well. Cool looking watch. We never see this. I mean, as a reference, 2254, but a little bit of a different take. Next, we're jumping to Nate and we're getting back into the Rolex side of things. We haven't seen a lot of Rolexes. It's great um, in the group UFO. Interesting. Thank you, Pant. Um, Gibson Explorer, <laughs> that's funny. So we haven't seen a lot of sports Rolex. We've seen many, many date justs, but not many of the heavy duty sports models for a change, which is quite nice. Um, Jackson King V from Hoplite, okay, awesome. Uh, Custom Shop 2, Dean 03, Gibson SG Menace. Thank you, Hoplite. Thank you for those details. Okay, so we're we getting back into the Rolex side and these of course are in demand like crazy because they're the, they're out of stock nowadays the uh they've been discontinued i should say and next to that beautiful photo by the way you really get to see it in its natural form in the light you know um and the amp head is a marshall jvm 410 let's get back to it <clears throat> i have a of an a, is it a vox it's a vox amp right it's in storage so i don't actually have it with me but it's a vox ac I think it's an AC15, not an AC30. Um, I've always loved the clean sound, but I'm dying to get myself a Marshall. I was thinking of getting myself a Fender amp one day. I don't know. Um, so it's great. It's nice seeing this watch and seeing it being used and worn and it's nice. Uh, don't like the idea that watches are just left in safes and not really used and abused. Vox, good for trebles. Yeah, so, so clean. Okay, going through. Prefer the all black than the Batman, Hans says. Um, Something about the all black that I really like is the bezel. I think the, the numerals on the bezel really is unique. Um, it, it adds a lot more visual presence to the dial and the details. I mean, you get to, I mean, look at that green on the hand and that little highlight. When you compare this to the Submariner, say the, the 116610, I think this does something quite special um, just with regards to presence and all of those details. And then next, this is also from Nate. And it is an Explorer, again. <laughs> this is our, I'd say we've, we've looked at about four Explorers, um, but I mean, it's just every single time you look at it, you just know it's there, it's good, does the job, does everything you'd ever need it to do. And I think there's something quite special about all of that. Um, great detail, again, beautiful shot from Nate. Uh, we get to see the Mark II and all of its glory with its lovely loomed numerals. Um, can't go wrong with it. Now that's a one watch collection, Hans. Yeah, it really is. I mean, when you think about it, when you really think down to it, the only thing that divides me about this watch is there are two elements. As a, as a one watch, um, the Mercedes Hour Hand, I don't find to be something that I enjoy wearing every day, even in that little Smith's Everest. Um, it's nice, but I, I find it quite jarring, not as clean as it could be. And then the only other detail that I don't really like, the numerals on the dial. I find that the modern numerals, I don't know where to place them, you know? It's, uh, is it modern? Is it retro? Is it a bit of both? Um, so, you know, I, it's, it's weird. <clears throat> As a stickler, I think I made a video about it saying, that's when you really are in the hobby, when you start saying, I don't like the watch because of the numerals, you know? Am I a snob for that reason? <laughs> then the black dial 39 OP, as Hans says, but then it's it's the layout of the dial that I love with this piece. 
I love the fact that you have the three, six, nine, and the triangle. So then technically, that beautiful blue dial that we saw, the uh, the, the 116000 OP blue dial with the, the date, the date just styled hands, that's something to look at then. Go for the 11470. I mean, it's just it's just never ending. It's so difficult when you're running a channel and you're talking about watch design, you need to get a good watch and you need to be able to have something that really epitomizes what you talk about, you know? And uh, that's that was the deep struggle. That's the the inner thing that I'm trying to co you know conflict with and against. Okay, jumping through. This is Neil. We pull up his Explorer again. We've had a look at that at the beginning of the show. This is from Neo. And I think Neo is in the chat. I've seen, there he is. That's hearsay. <laughs> uh, I've just had a deja vu. You wouldn't believe. I just had a deja vu of you saying that, Neo. Um, because uh, I feel like I've spoken about it before. Heresy. That's funny. Did I say hearsay? Heresy. I don't know. I've been doing this for two hours. I think my uh, coffee supply is running low. Let me just fill myself up again. Brandon Marks, do I think Rolex will announce their watches about Baselworld? Yeah, I think they will. I mean, they have to move their stock. They have to. They, they still are a business. There's no point in stopping at all. Um, it's just a question of how. And I would imagine at this point in time, if we're lucky, we get to see it featured online. I mean, that would be good enough. Um, I just don't know how brands can't be more savvy with, with social media in general, using a platform like YouTube to... Uh, you know, highlight the watches in hand. It's not difficult. I mean, it's nice seeing CAD renders and everything, but you want to see it in hand. And you would imagine a few Rolex representatives just sitting there playing with the watches, showing us what they do. Um, yeah, but if you know if you know this channel and you know me, I like critiquing stuff often, which is probably why many people don't like what I do. <laughs> I can be quite brutal with a lot of things, uh, talking about details and elements. Anyway. So running through this piece from Neo, I don't know anything about this brand, Mar Margaret, Margaret, uh, but there's mention about loving the double numerals. There is something about that balance that I really like. And it's an element that I think is missed with uh, the Air King, the, the new Air King with all of those numerals set up around it, the zero and the five. I mean, I did a bit, if again, if you look up the video on the channel, I said something like the, the Air King is the unsung hero. The reason why the Air King is an unsung hero, I do a bit of a redesign of the watch. So it is almost like a cushion case. Absolutely. That's from N something. Um, interesting looking piece. I mean, look how fat that thing is. I don't know anything about this brand. So Neo, please enlighten us if you, if you would. Uh, but it is military inspired. It looks like it's taking cues from, from 30s and 50s elements. And uh, oh, look at that loom shot, though. Whew. Now that is something. That is something amazing. There's another loom shot coming afterwards. Um, so Chaitan says you don't like them, say he's hand every day, so perhaps an OP. But the OP is nice. I mean, it's simple, basic, elegant. <clears throat> the one thing that I don't like about it is that it's almost too simple. You know, this is how bad it is. I, you can just imagine me sitting in the corner, you know, on my arms wrapped around my knees, rocking back and forth, like my hair sticking out, thinking, like, what's, what do I want? I need something that's simple, but also visually complex. How difficult is that, for, is that to achieve? Quite difficult, <laughs> you know, in the scheme of things. Um, it needs to be pretty small in size, great amount of detail and presence, it needs to come from a good name. Yeah, there's lots of little things. I highlight it in the, in the final reveal video. So yeah, chasing one's tail, absolutely, Reed. Uh, I, I beat myself up on the subject, but yeah. Anyway, getting through. This is awesome. It's so, this is an amazing loom shot. I love that. Deep. This looks like a proper desk clock. Bedside clock, Hans, exactly. It feels like a desk clock. It feels like something you can just prop up and just have that running all night. Amazing. Something about loomed bezels as well. That's one detail. New Zealand brand, Ashley says. Thank you for that. Let's get to, a, let's get to the full shot again. Um, I've lost my train of thought. One thing, oh, loomed bezels. One thing I didn't mention about the Bond Seamaster. If you haven't looked at views from Mark, he, did a, he has a channel that talks mainly about Bond watches. He has the Spectre edition and he has the new No Time to Die watch. Um, have a look at it. He's doing pretty well. He's getting lots of attention. The loom on, on that new No Time to Die watch is amazing. Uh, really stands out well. Why watches don't have loomed bezels nowadays? Beyond me. 
It adds such a nice dynamic, makes it so much more functional, practical. Um, okay, catching up, Marcello. Uh, thank you for, oh, it's a pleasure. And congratulations, Marcello. Again, I'll say um, I also won a design award for a uh, LAMP competition in 2014. Um, couldn't afford a watch back then. I mean, geez, as a student, you know, just living off bread and cheese mainly. <laughs> um, good times though. It's an absolute pleasure. And congratulations, really. That's a beautiful Grand Seiko. I've never seen one without a date before. So you really managed to grab a stunner. Okay. So Neo, thank you for sending this in. Very interesting. Uh, don't suffer trying to have one perfect watch. Have several and enjoy all the elements you like. Mike. I agree. I mean, it's it's... I think it's coming to terms with the idea that you will never find that perfect watch, but you have to, you know, it's like with a person in life. It's like when you get married, you'll never find that perfect person, but you just have to deal with all the good things and all the flaws. Um, anyway, getting into this. So this is from nine bolts should be in the chat. He's normally here. Pi pan Connie as, uh, as Bud Owen says. So this is a reference one, six, eight, zero, zero, five Pi pan constellation. And I'm in the process of writing up, a, a video about the Globe Master constellation, the latest. Um, and I think it's, it's such an amazing history and the, the whole pie pan layout. I'm clarifying what pie pan means in the video, which is important, I think, because when I got into this hobby, I had no idea what pie pan was. People said so fast, I used to think people meant pie panned, not pie pan, pie panned. <laughs> and I was getting so confused. I thought it had to do with something like with the batons and it is just typically a, a reversed pie pan that you have on the dial. Uh, great effect. These, these pieces are, they're loved by everyone. Apple pie pan, yeah, exactly. I mean, the alliteration as it is, you know, you struggle. Um, beautiful piece. I've had a look at lots of vintage Omegas and they're everywhere, you know. Um, next, the saucer from Nine Bolts. Fears Brunswick. Now, Fears as a brand is quite something. Um, James, founder Timeless Capital, knows the owner of Fears, and it would be so good to be introduced to that family and, and have a good look because these watches have some amazing history in the UK. Uh, I'm just catching up with all of you here. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool looking watch, right? Um, I am your constellation, <laughs> True Fears. Um, so, Fears as a brand has been around for a really long time. And they've got quite the history around them. And I thought it would be nice to discuss them in the future as well. Maybe get some hands-on time and, and discuss just how the brand has evolved and developed. Look how gorgeous these skeleton needle, what we call them syringe-styled hands, skeletonized look. And even the idea of dots instead of batons, it also completes the, the watch a lot. If I'm not wrong, these, these inspirational pieces were taken directly from the original vintage watches of the time. And they've done a great job here. Great amount of presence. I'd say it's about 39 mils. I've uh, got a cushion-shaped case. Nice. Let me look. It's got brushing on the case and polishing on the lugs. Beautiful. Looks like an ostrich strap. Blue on blue on blue. Different shades. Got a rail dial on the outside. We don't see many of these. So it's nice seeing this on the show with a sub-dial. Uh, if I'm not wrong, this is taken almost directly from the original Fears watches back in the day. Um, it's one of the oldest watch brands in the UK, actually. They've been around since the 1800s and uh, cool history. I'd love to look in them in more detail. So Nine Bolts, thank you for this. And I think you sent me another one. Oh, wow, look at that. Now we get a better idea of what the dial looks like. Brushed, came here for German watches, William. <laughs> well, we've seen lots of Zins. Um, and there is another Lunger coming up in a second, another few Lunger. So it is a great looking watch, Russell interesting combination of elements and uh, look at that brushing just again having a good focus if I zoom right in this is an excellent photo we really get a good understanding of its play in light so as a brand I mean if you want some some British heritage tied to a name I think Smith's is a good name but uh, Fears is a cut above the rest I think these retail uh, for, you cannot buy Fears with tears no tears for Fears <laughs> from the closet these these aren't the cheapest. I mean, when I first saw these, I thought they would be around the ballpark of like 500 to 600 pounds plus minus. They are a thousand pounds plus. I think they're like two grand a piece. Um, I don't know what movements they use, but I definitely need to look into this brand more. I'd actually like to do a write up on them in the future. So it's great. I mean, it's so nice being able to highlight these pieces because we just don't see them, you know? Um, 
This is from Norman. Now we're getting into some more pieces. Norman sent a whole range of watches. He's got a Grand Seiko he's rocking. This is not your Snowflake, but it has the same kind of format as the Snowflake. Um, spring drive. I love the texture of the spring drive gauge. It's one thing Grand Seiko knows how to knows what to do. Um, it's that it's that idea of of added detail, simplicity but detail. Um, a lot of radio here. Well said. Uh, too old for two wheels. And, and G, of course. Okay. So, moving on. The boils add interesting asymmetry to ostrich track. Yeah, I mean, ostrich ostrich leather is peculiar. Huh? If you ever had uh, ostrich biltong, biltong is basically dried meat. Big thing that happens in South Africa. That's uh, just Southern Africa in general. And uh, ostrich biltong is quite amazing because there's no fat on it. Um, it's, it's virtually, the animal is virtually fat free. And it's quite an amazing taste. So, Grand Seiko. So I don't know what the reference is. He just dropped all these watches in, and this was one of the first. This is one of the, the last. Should I say the last submissions for the show? So I just had to drop the names. Grand Seiko next. Now we have a Reverso. Oh, what is this? This this could be a Grand. Let me just try and get a better shot. This looks like this is the first Reverso for the show. Believe it or not, and it looks like a Grand Reverso. Uh, don't know, is that a date complication at the top? Please, someone enlighten me um, on the details here. I love the symmetry. I've never seen this complication at the top. What does that have to do? Is that just 24-hour time? It might be because it's 8, 10 past 8. That could be the case. Um, fears start at around 2,500. Thanks, Thomas. That's great. Um, my ex-wife is from Zim, two altar, two wheels. Kudu Biltong is amazing as well. Elan Kudu. Some amazing biltongs out there. I mean, if you want to go to South Africa, just measures your weight. <laughs> and that is amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, could be a dual time or it could just be a 24-hour time. I don't know. Someone could maybe clarify. Um, so nice looking piece. I love the balance and the symmetry. I think this is the only reverso we're going to see on the show. And uh, there was another great line that I saw a second ago. Talking about fears, prices. Uh, yeah, that was about it. Have you ridden an ostrich? I haven't, Eric. Um, I was when I was young. I actually watched ostrich racing quite a lot, but I never got on one. I thought, nah, I was a bit uh, a bit small. <laughs> uh, funny though. Next, this is also from Norman, and he's rocking a little Smith's Everest on a really heavy duty leather strap, and this looks like the thirty six mil, just like mine. Uh, if you haven't seen the video, put it out on Thursday, and it was a lot of fun sharing some thoughts on the piece. I would like to go a bit more in depth in the future. There is ostrich racing. Of course there is pilot style. I mean, they, ostriches are riding people now. <laughs> so it's amazing. I mean, you get to watch, look it up on YouTube. You'll see it. Guys get on the backs of them. They put blindfolds over the top of them and they basically dice two ostriches on a, on a stretch and they carry a person. No problem. I mean, they're amazing birds. They're, I think they're the tallest, the tallest land bird in the world. They're the creepiest things. And uh, if you're from South Africa, just Southern Africa in general, they're all over the place. Uh, you see them in huge herds, especially when you're traveling across the Karoo, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, Smith's Everest, I love it. I find it to be such a charming watch. It's a watch I wear when I don't want to think about watches, and I think that says a lot about what it's able to do. Um, just the numerals and everything, ah, oh, I just love it. It's such a cute little thing. Next, this is also from Norman. Zenith El Primero, another one. This is a beaut. So this has more of an integrated. I just I cannot believe how many El Primeros there are in the world. I mean, just just think about it. How many have we looked at in this show alone? Like what six, seven now? <laughs> the bracelet and case integration. That's what I wanted to say in something. Just just superb. I think it's so clean. You've got these inset. It looks like some kind. I don't know if it's it's gold or not. But you've got these inset spaces around that matches the, the dial, details on the dial. Um, very interesting looking watch. I love the contrast and the balance. Peculiar. El Movado. <laughs> that's so funny. And that's lying up with the uh, the 12 o'clock. Very good point, bud. That's funny. That's funny. Um, nice contrast of the gray and the subdials. I mean, you can read this watch pretty well in good enough lighting. Under, underrated brand. That's funny. We've been talking about... Um, IWC being overrated, Zenith being underrated. Yeah, they're everywhere. And there's some amazing watches they offer. 
and is it me or not many speed masters? There's a few speed masters that we will see. And uh, we saw a professional from Les earlier, but there are a few more as we get through. And then this was this was his last submission, also from Norman. And I have no idea what it is, but he said this is this is essentially a Rolex for a twentieth of the price. <laughs> and I said Zenith sub question mark. No idea what it's called, but it is a Zenith. It's Swiss made. So it must have an ETA or some some peculiar movement in it. Has anyone ever seen one of these before? Also on an awesome leather strap. I don't know what this is. No idea. But uh, I just find it so peculiar. You see these watches come out of the woodwork. You just you just don't know. You don't know what it is. Is it a micro brand? Is it an homage? No idea. So uh, we are slowly but surely <laughs> getting through these, and it's going to get good as we're rolling. We're doing pretty well. I think we will surpass the three-hour mark. We will be a bit longer tonight, uh, or wherever you are in the world. It's tonight here in the UK. But uh, there are some amazing watches as we get through. There's some Lungers, um, some more Zins, some Daytonas, some Speedmasters, some Zeeblu Milgausses, and a really great watch at the end of the show as well. Zenith Bank Watch. Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea what this watch is, but I just thought it was hilarious. So, Norman, thank you for sending these in. Next, from N Something. If N Something is still in the chat, I'm pretty sure he is. Uh, so, we had a look at the Pioneer. And I need you to clarify if this is also a Pioneer. This feels like the, the more dress-oriented Pioneer watch. Beautiful photo, first off. And uh, it's, it's amazing because he has two Pioneers that look very similar. Uh, the one that we saw in the very beginning of the show, which is the more sports-oriented variant with a blue Fumé dial. Endeavor, it's the Endeavor. Okay, the Endeavor white gold. It's amazing how similar but different the two watches look. So in something has both this and the Pioneer with the, with the Fumé dial. The case design is ever so different. Polishing is different. Uh, you can see that the hands are very similar, but also uh, this is much more sporty and elegant in the way it presents itself. And uh, the best company script, yeah, I think it's it's stunning. Let's get it right in. I mean, that 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 swirl is gorgeous. Looks like it was handwritten, you know. And there's something about brands. One one thing I love about brands, like like IWC, we looked at that last week. Highly recommend you have a look at. Um, I did a video. We had a live stream last week Saturday where we looked at watch design and the evolution, and we went through a catalog. And IWC with their original script back in the day was just. It's beautiful. I wish IWC would do it with their watches now. Um, yeah, talking about a dress watch, this is stunning. Presence, size, proportion, balance. Moser, underrated. I think it's, it's a future classic. As a brand, it's going to be sought after a lot in the future. Uh, just because they, they only make like a thousand, how many? A couple thousand watches a year, maybe, maybe 3,000. And uh, yeah, I mean, it just does it all. It's all you need. It's a real, and you turn it around and you just, you know, beautiful. Okay, now we're moving on. So, and something, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the submission. 1,500. And, and so, yes, it is a hand wound. I'm pretty sure it is. Maybe it's a micro rotor. Can't remember. Okay, moving through. Paul, Yachtmaster 2. We never, ever, ever, ever see this watch. And I thought this, this is quite the piece to highlight on the show. The Yacht Master 2. Now, everyone hates it. I, I made a video about it saying, why is the Yacht Master so hated? A year ago, at least. Highly recommend you look it up because I talk about the Yacht Master 1 and this piece and run through just what it means, how it was inspired and everything else. And the, the way Paul explained this in the email, if I remember right, I don't know what the reference is. You're right, uh, Ant. I don't, know what the, I don't know what the reference is. He just mentioned Yacht Master 2. I didn't highlight the reference. Uh, you survived the supermarket. Welcome back, Tom. So he said, what he said about this watch was that he knows it's polarizing. He knows everyone hates it and it's peculiar and strange, but he loves the fact that it's like the most complicated watch that Rolex makes and it's just so rugged. He has a, he has a th six and a three quarter inch wrist, 44 mil size, fits him pretty well. And he loves the fact that it's just a watch that is so strange and peculiar, but is also highly complicated and uh, the colors are cool. If you don't know what this watch does, it's a regatta timer. And it's like, it's the most peculiar complication out there. Simply, it's a 10 minute countdown timer. So if you had a countdown bezel on your watch, you could do the same thing, but you start the chronograph and this hand, depending on how you set the hand, 
this hand will then count down 10 minutes. So every minute it will jump across and that's it. It's such a basic complication. And the real argument is when would you ever use this watch? Uh, for, for a 10 minute countdown. If you're cooking something, if you're, I mean, 10 minutes is pretty short. Normally when you cook something, it's like 15 to 20. But uh, the complication alone is interesting. And I, I do I do think that the highlights and the accents and the details is something to pay attention to. Um, niche piece, Reed Cookshank says. And if I remember, he also mentioned, I think it was, it was Paul who said, he had this on his right wrist because on his left, he was wearing a sub. And... Um, he had just got this from the AD. I can't remember the story exactly. But this, this blue is so bright. I'm actually like going blind. <laughs> nice contrast of the sweater with the bezel. Uh, such a peculiar watch, but it's so good having it on the show. Um, so nice seeing it in its natural habitat. Well, not natural habitat, but just on display. Um, not my sort of unapo unapologetic nautical. It does look like a nautical watch in a way, right? has those elements. Like It almost looks like the... The wheel of a ship in a way um so regatta timer unique and there's talk about ulysses nodan ulysses nodan absolutely they make some of the best regatta timers um people don't know sweater anymore <laughs> uh anyway so and it is white gold i'm pretty as reed says this is a white gold piece this is also one of the most expensive watches that rolex has in their catalog but of course, the one garish element is the yacht master written on the bezel. I so wish they didn't do that with this piece. Yeah, peculiar, strange, interesting, nuts. Pilot style. If you're in the chat, you're up next. Oh yes, oh yes. So pilot style just submitted a 80s 34 millimeter Rolex Air King, and that, I mean, really, is that that's all you need, right? It's it's just killer. I think it's so clean and simple, elegant, beautiful layout. Um, on, the, on the black strap as well, just turns it down. There's a gorgeous day date that we're going to see in a second. And it should be up quite soon, actually. Yeah, Ryan. Ryan sent in a 72 date date that we'll have a look at just now. And uh, flip and zippo, it's a 34 mil, this size. So I'm sure this is uh, 18 carats. It'd be nice to know, uh, pilot style, if, if we could give us more details on the on the watch itself, but the Air King Precision, again, I'll say it's it's a watch that really is understated in the family and, and something that is uh, unloved by a lot of people because of course, sports watches are everything nowadays. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's just beautiful. So thank you for sending this. And of course the contrast and the lighting and you get every, every detail highlighted. There's something about gold on gold, which is fascinating. And you'll see this now in the, in the day date, gold capped. Thank you, Pilot Style. Yeah, great. Air King, we've had a look at a few of these. They're awesome. Next is from Reed, and Reed should be in the chat. This is his Zelos Mako 2. I don't know anything about Zelos as a brand. I just know that they're a micro brand. It's about as far as I know. Ha Air King, <laughs> as Truthfears says, that's funny. Um, we have had a look at this watch before, and just the detail, one thing that blew me away about this watch is that fingerprint effect that the dial has. I just. I just, I find it so peculiar. Never seen it before in my life. Um, is this a bronze? I would imagine this is a bronze watch. It's definitely polarizing for many reasons, but I think the balance is also something to commend. Uh, they, they also went quite heavy with the plots. Look at all the different plots on the, on the dial in the minute track and then plots around the bezel. It really is quite the heavy duty, duty diver. Looks like it's 500 meters waterproof, which is something pretty nuts. And, uh, that was great. It's great seeing this variety. I mean, we've we've been rocking through everything, and it's going to get good. Trust me, it gets better and better as we go through. There's going to be some more great stuff coming up in a second. Um, a very interesting dial. I think that's the one element that I like so much. Reed is the is the fingerprint effect. I don't know how they get this this radial expression all the way through it. If it's machine done, if it's if it's done through a through a process, no idea. Okay. Carrying on, I also love the heavy duty strap. It's nice seeing that contrast. So thank you, Reed. You take some amazing shots as well. You've been sending in a lot of Seiko Alpinists in the past and it's great, great having it up. Oh, geez, here comes the next longer. Are we ready, everyone? Are we ready? Riley with a Saxonia Thin 37, the second Saxonia Thin. Look at that shot, it's just insane. Okay, so Ant, Ant G submitted a Saxonia Thin at the beginning of the show. 
and what a laugh. We get another one <laughs> on the same show, you know. Uh, oh, just look at it in that in that space right there, in that lighting, that presence. It's just cool, right? You know, <laughs> tissues on standby, flip and zipper, that's funny. It is, it is gorgeous. I think there's no getting away from it. I mean, the one gripe I have with it is I would find it too simple. I think as a, as an everyday wearing watch, I'd just find it too simple, even though it's just beautiful. And it's because of that, that it is a longer, uh, it's just too simple for my tastes really, but you just can't get away from it. It is gorgeous. And you just get right in, get to see the batons placements, just even the height of the batons on the dial compressed pocket watch in the purest form. And I think he sent me another shot. So this is great seeing it in the car as it's rolling. Nice. And then moving across, this is another, oh, geez, oh, geez, oh, no, get back. We missed it. Here we are. So Riley got us a nice shot of a engraved balance cock, as we call it in the hobby. Oi. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just beautiful. Okay, I'm going to catch up with you guys because I haven't I haven't been, uh, oh, two old for two wheels. You're calling it. Okay. There's some good stuff. Trust me, there's some good stuff to catch up on. We've got another few Lungas. We've got some Zeblu Milgausses, 50s Seamasters, some vintage Omegas coming up, uh, some IWCs. There's some great stuff. So I would say stick around for another 20-ish minutes, and we'll be able to gun through the rest before the show has ended. Um, how beautiful is this photo? Mm. Uh, maybe the best dress watch in the world, Richard Rosa. I think, yeah, it does. It sits in that same position as Lunga. We were talking, we were talking about it earlier. Uh, the, the 5196 and this piece, just where they sit in relation to each other. What Pogue was that? We're going to look at it now. It's an original Pogue. We're going to be looking at that in a second from Rob. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, what can you say? We've, we've spoken about this watch at length. What a beautiful... Riley, if you're here, if you're catching up with the show, please send more of these. <gasps> Come back. <laughs> we've got an original Pogue we're going to be looking at now, of course. Uh, we, we need to see more of this. I mean, the photography is just incredible. So thank you, Riley, for sending it in. And Ant, Ant, thank you for sending yours in. Uh, two Saxonia Thins in one show. Hi, have we ever seen that before in the past? Don't think so. So as I say, it's a pleasure being able to highlight these watches with all of you and, and talk through. Um, so moving to Rob, and he has a watch channel. He's done a review of this piece. Uh, and his channel is called Mountain Standard Time. And I'll put it into the chat right now. Mountain Standard Time. So he's done a review of this watch. You can follow him and have a look at what he's done. Uh, and the Pogue is a watch that I want to do a write-up on because I just find it to be so peculiar and strange. I mean, it being worn by Captain Pogue, General Pogue, I don't know. <laughs> uh I just, the dial is just, it's just crazy. I think it's peculiar, put it that way. Um, I'd like to talk about the design and try and understand why Seiko did this. There he is, Mountain Standard Time. Welcome. Uh, follow, get onto his channel, have a look at the review of this watch. Um, I definitely am not one Colonel Pogue, thank you. I'm definitely not one to talk about the Seiko Pogue. I haven't studied it at all. I don't know much about the history, but I would like to break down the design and try and understand why they went with this color scheme egg yolk dial absolutely it's amazing just how this just the dial set and the, the pepsi-esque bezel has become the character for the brand at this point in time um trick is to keep the second hand running always <laughs> is that because it doesn't hack or is that because it's it, it, you can't wind it or something i don't know uh, but it's another one of those characters i mean this and the and the what what would we say um this and the seiko SKX, the, uh, what were we looking at earlier? The turtle, drawing a blank. The turtle is another one. They all lie in that same kind of category of being icons for the brand. Um, there is no running seconds, really, Chi Town. That's amazing. I did not know that. It's another thing. So it only has a subdial, base subdial for 30 minutes. Crazy. So thank you for sending these in, Rob. Uh, Mountain Standard Time. Stopping it hurts the movement. That's amazing. See, I'm, I'm learning all of this. So everyone, check out his video on this piece. He will know a lot more about this piece than I do. Um, be great. And Thomas Burnett, thank you for the super chat. Everyone who's been here and been watching the show all the way through, can't thank you enough. And we're just about to jump to Russell. And we're going to be looking at some of the best pieces on the show by far. So get ready. Are we ready? 
Are we ready? Here we go. Ulysses Nardan, Tellurium Platinum. Now this watch is one of 99 pieces ever made, okay? And it's like one of the most complicated watches ever for all sorts of reasons. It's, it's actually nuts. So apparently it's set uh, right at the center of the North Pole and you're seeing the Earth as it is from the moon at this very point in time. Uh, it also had, there also had to do with some, there was a crazy change on the 20th of March. There was this, this biannual compacts period of the moon phase. I have no idea. He sent me this long description explaining what, what happened, but I just couldn't in time. Again, this was one of the last submissions. And uh, when it comes to telling the time, that is also what I was trying to work out. And who asked that question? Um, Hoplight. So this looks to be the minutes and this looks to be the hours and it runs on its own separate track. But this thing has everything. It has moon phase, perpetual calendar, the whole deal. I, I honestly, I don't even know how to read it. But the way it was explained to me is that it, it, it uses global tracking from the moon to determine uh, where the earth is standing exactly, uh, the alignment on the equator and all of these details. I, I have, this is so above and beyond me. Um, I think Watch Art Sai needs to have a look at this piece because I just don't know. I need to study this kind of stuff. This is just super, super, super high horology. Um, so it's great seeing this. Of course, talking about the, the finishing, this has an enamel dial, as you can imagine, all hand painted. Um, only one of 99 made as an anniversary piece. Platinum case, super high end. I just wish I knew how it all worked. Uh, yeah, so this is like the map of the world. Um, so I do need to cover this in more detail, understand, but the next watch is what really caught my attention. Now, if we know Russell, moon rotates, anti-clock, Russell's in the chat, fantastic. Okay, Russell 996, there he is. So if you'd like to grab his attention, get him. Eight minutes to one. Okay, so he's, he's telling us the time and everything else. Uh, I bet the data graph lumens next. Yeah, Spilker's compass, yeah, you kind of kind of ruined it there. So uh, what happened was last week, the last time we had a show, Russell submitted the uh, Phantom Zeitwerk. And he said, you know, since we talked about the Phantom Zeitwerk in the last show, you have to talk about the longer data graph lumen in this show. And I have <clears throat> just just uh, broke, broke my voice there a little bit in uh, pure amazement. Stream is getting glitchy, Flip and Zippo. Is that so? Um, I have a huge fascination for this watch. Let me know if, if the stream is bad and you can uh, just tell me. I hope, hope you're not breaking up here. So beautiful details. I mean, the data graph, it's one of the, the first longer that I ever had hands-on time with. And uh, the Lumen is quite the curiosity piece. It's a real character. It's stunning. I think what Russell does so well is, okay, it's good. You can hear me. That's fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Uh, what I like about Russell, he's got a he's got an Instagram handle. Please put your Instagram handle in in the chat, Russell. Um, I can't remember it for the life of me, but he has a concise collection, but also top of the line pieces in that collection. So he has the top of the line Nautilus, the, the, the crazy perpetual calendar Nautilus that came out a few years ago, um, and he has both the Zeitwerk. Uh, what did I call it again? The Zeitwerk Phantom and the Datagraph Lumen. And of course, we have some other photos seeing just the sheer detail. You move it into a different light and you get to see it in another situation. I mean, it's just, now it looks like the dial is completely invisible, you know? Ah, it's just, it's beautiful. Beautiful looking watch. And it's just, it's just top of the line. Um, the first, the first Datagraph that I wore was the Platinum. Platinum Datagraph. And I was just blown away by how heavy it was. And the size and everything. I mean, this watch is what, 39 mils? It wears so well, so compact. Um, having that added effect of a lumen dial and all of those details is nuts. I'd love to connect with you, Russell, and try and understand just how you got such a good taste in all of these pieces and how it's, I mean, this is refinement galore. Oh, just look at this. <laughs> I mean, where else in the world do we get to see this kind of stuff? It's just, I honestly, I put my feet back. I clap my hands and just thank you all so much for sending these watches in because, I mean, nuts, out of this world. 
so yeah, of all the watches in the longer line, I think the 1815 is one that really appeals to me, but the Datagraph Lumen, I love the idea. And why don't they make more chronographs that glow in the dark, you know? Uh, it's just superb, it's so great seeing this. Check that contrast, just in a little bit of different light. Looks like the watch does have anti-reflective coating on the dial, so it manages to make it look virtually invisible in certain lights, and then a good shock from the light. So peculiar. But I'm so glad that Lunga, Lunga is really a brand that manages to make their watches look so traditional, but at the same time, push the boundaries when it comes to their technology. I mean, at this point, they have triple splits. They, some brands don't even have double splits. And I think Lunga also did a quintuple split at one stage. They just, they go nuts. And uh, yeah, it's nice to see that Lunga gets the love that they deserve. Should have sent a loom shot, Russell. Yeah, don't worry. Next next time, uh, June, what is it? April, April the 9th. Uh, when I'm doing my big first luxury watch unveiling, April 9th, I'll be wearing my watch for the show, which will be great. And also, please, by all means, send what you like, because Russell, these are just nuts. Uh, it's a pity your name doesn't start with A, so that, like, I should feature this at the beginning of the show, no? Uh, this is really for the people who've been watching all the way through. That's what makes it so great. Okay, so Russell, thank you so much for sending this in. I mean, just nuts. Uh, if you can put your, your Instagram handle in the chat, I need to follow you on Instagram. I don't even think I have you. Okay, next to Ryan. Now, this really caught my attention. Now, I'm not a day-date guy. I'm definitely not someone who loves the watch that much. I can appreciate it. I really can appreciate it. But uh, this one, hell, oh, it is beautiful. So it's a reference 1803 from 1972. This is from Ryan. It's got a Pipan-esque sort of dial to it. And I love the gold on gold with the leather strap. I mean, it's just class, no? It is just class. I, I think the balance, the it's gorgeous. And I never thought I would say that about a day date for, for my test. It's the kind of day date that I would gravitate towards, whether it's, I think the white dial would appeal to me more. But just everything. You mentioned about the fluted bezel looking good. I think the, the way they've done the presence and the scaling of the fluted bezel with these watches, it's just a thing of its own, you know? Um, Pipan-esque dial, if you get right in there. I don't know what you would call this dial, but I know the 1803 has this interesting depth to the way the dial's arranged. Beautiful numerals on the outside, uh, distinct, distinctive 70s batons around it. Excellent condition as well. Look how sharp the case is. So, Ryan, this is a winner. Hey? This is one of the best watches I've seen on the show by Miles. Pet Shop Boy, ah, oh, fantastic. I mean, this is a killer. And on the, on the leather, you could wear this every day and no one would know. And I think that's what makes it so cool. You know you're wearing just cake pan <laughs> by Owen. Is that what you call it? Um, I, I love the fact that you could wear this every day and it's a top-of-the-line Rolex day date, but so understated that no one would know what it is. Um, that's oh, gorgeous. So thank you, Ryan, for this. Now we're jumping to S and Sam. We just I think we've just gone over three hours. No? Let me just refresh and be sure. <sighs> Stream three hours ago. My God. I don't know how I'm able to do this for so long. Coffee helps. So moving on to Sam. Just a little little 2254 Seamaster that we're going to have a look at briefly. Oh no, 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 no. Mouse work with me here. Going back to Ryan, back to Sam. So this is a this looks like a 36 mil, but I might be wrong. The 2254 we've spoken about a lot in the past. And uh, Michael Caine, Get Carter, absolutely, uh, Hans. If you haven't watched Get I really, I highly recommend you watch Michael Caine in Get Carter because he rocks this with his shotgun. I can't remember what the shotgun is, but it looks so good. Such a class. So this was a really low res image. So I'm getting right in there. 36 mil, 2254. The shadows make it look great as well. Fulman, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the shadows on the dial, another thing to highlight, really makes it a great photo. I don't know why the magic mouse is playing up with me. You really get to see the, the level of depth everywhere. And it's such a low, I mean, the, the sun must be so low. It must be really over here at the background. Oh, I love it. This came in quite close to the end before the show began. And I had to feature it. So 2254. I think it's a 2254, 36 mil. It's a watch that we speak about a lot. People people enjoy it. Um, little Rolex stole the show for me, Johnny. It's a gorgeous piece, right? I, I thought it really did. For me as well. It was one of the watches that really stood out. We're not done yet. We've got some Daytonas coming up. We've got a few other little bits and pieces. 
Um, this watch is great. Nice amount of presence. I think the blend is cool. Uh, Hoplite says, I chose the Amiga Great White GMT because I didn't have the peanut butter helium release. And, and these, these uh, helium release valves, I mean, they are peculiar. It's one element that I really don't like about this whole line, the professional line. Uh, it's, it's what's become ingrained into the family at this point in time. They seem to love the idea, but it just doesn't do it for me. Um, since, since we know that you just don't need it, it's very unnecessary. It's more of a conversation starter and just at this point, it's, it's something to add a bit more, uh, bit more character to the name, uh, to the brand. I don't know how you'd best say it. It's an added detail that doesn't need to be there. I could say that much. Um, yeah, but it's awesome. So thank you for sending this in, Sam. I can't believe we've gone over three hours. I need to hurry up because there are some still to go. Another one from Sam. This is a, a Zin 104104A. And we've spoken about this watch a lot in the past. A real aviation piece. Uh, you can just see all the elements and details. I, again, we've seen a couple of Zins during the show uh, with regards to contrast, with regards to all of the little bits and pieces when it comes to line weight all of those details. I love this kind of text. Why more brands don't highlight this on their watches, I don't know. There's something so characteristic about it. Um, and Hans says, best Omega Seamaster. Yeah, it is cool. Uh, if you're talking about the, the oh, you're talking about the 2232, oh, it's awesome. German date wheel, German watch is a must. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's just German all the way through to the core. Beautiful needle hands, it's another element that I love, or syringe hands, I should say. Okay, moving through, jumping to Sasha with a Steinhardt Kermit. <laughs> Bit of a change of pace, trust me. There's some good stuff to come just now. Um, this was one of the first watches I had. I've spoke about this in a, in a show before. And these things are bulletproof. I mean, as much as of a, of a micro brand and an homage brand, these are actually bulletproof. You can run over this with a car and it will still work fine, which is amazing. I mean, when you talk about value for money, it's pretty good. But then there's the whole debate about what is what is homage, what is not homage, uh, where does it sit in the scheme of things, all of those details. Um, interesting looking piece, though. And I call it the Kermit. I don't know what they really call it, but it has that green bezel. Quite a nice green bezel. It's not a bright green. It's, uh, it's olive, in a way, offset. One thing that I really detest with these watches is that, that uh, anti-reflective coating. You can see the coating is on the underside of the glass. That's one thing that really put me off sign art watches in general is the idea that this coating is just so bright and in your face. I would rather have a, a watch without anti-reflective coating if it means that I don't get to see this huge reflection underneath. And it's nice. I mean, we've seen everything from Steinhardt to Patek and everything all the way through and longer. We haven't actually seen a Patek yet, but we will in the end. Okay, next. So thank you for this, Sasha. Next is from Sean Smith's W10. And Interesting, check in the background. I think this was him actually watching the show. <laughs> That's so cool. This was last week's show. I did a rotation of a, of a Batman GMT. He's obviously catching up. Smith's W10. Now, uh, from Sean, I remember him saying in his mail to me that he, he should have really thought about keeping the one that he was issued. Uh, he was actually issued this watch in the military, if I remember right. And uh, he he must have lost it over time <laughs> he managed to get the reissue the, the homage to the original uh, but it's pretty funny like you know he had this piece and ever since or is this an original am i even no it's not because it says luminova not tritium and it should say made in england on the on the base so this is the reissue but he did have an original the way he worded it to me um and i mean the smith's w10 said it millions of times it's beautiful i love the i love the leather strap integration as well just adds another detail it's nice to see lots of Smiths being shown on the show for a change. Uh, yeah, I love it. Smiths is great. Okay, going to carry on. We've got an Orient Babino from Shri. I can't remember the watch that he sent in last week. I think, actually, the watch that we featured, the cover photo of the last show was his Ming, the Ming uh, copper that we used. This is another one. Now, these watches are also undervalued, I think. Um, important in the hobby when you're getting into the hobby you know um they're affordable easy to attain also just great dress watches when you look at the way they've arranged the numerals and the size and the placement i think it's about 39 mils in proportion altogether 
lost in the Mekong Delta <laughs> perpetual. Yeah, I really don't know the story, but it's pretty funny. I, I really enjoyed it. Again, it was quite a late submission, so I had to catch up. So uh, interesting watch, this Orient. And uh, I do, I find it I find it peculiar in a way, like the idea of Orient being on the dial, I don't really like that much. But it's it's nice seeing that it's a brand that takes a dress watch quite seriously with its approach, you know, with regards to its, its scale and size and proportions in general, wearing on the wrist and all of those details. Um, for what you're getting, value for money wise, I think these are pretty good. There was another one that I was really looking at back in the day with the 36912 on the dial. I can't, it was a Bambino of some kind, I remember. Um, but yeah, the, the Orient logo, I think it's the one element that I don't like, but it's so nice seeing this beautiful cursive text used. It'd be so great to see that from more brands. Okay, carrying on. We've already surpassed three hours. I need to hurry up here. This is from Steve. Steve is quite the tinkerer and he's tried to make a 1016 homage using parts from raffles. I have no idea what raffles is, but uh, this was these are a couple of his hobby watches that uh, he enjoys putting together. I think he wanted, he said to me that he wanted to experience the size of a 1016 and get an idea of the dial and everything. This handset looks to be like something from a Ranger. Nice seeing it though. It's nice seeing people getting busy with a bit of modifying too. Um, I'm by no means a mod person. The best I do is drop my watches in bleach or take a Dremel tool or do some polish, polishing, but that's about it. So it's nice seeing someone doing some hands-on work. I think he has a few more. This is also from Steve. Okay, hold on a sec. So this is this is also from Steve, and this is a Type 2 military dial that he's also tinkered with, with a cushion case, all of those details. Really nice to see. And then I think this is the same Steve, or it's, it's another Steve, who sent in this Prince Date. Beautiful looking watch. These are really sought after nowadays, hey? I mean, the prices for these are just as bad as Submariner's at this point in time. And... I think if Tudor ever had to release a Submariner, it would be so good to see this placement, this dial arrangement again. Uh, like I said, with the, the earlier Tudor that we looked at, the mini sub, um, yeah, gorgeous. And they're talking about the, the other pieces. I'm gonna, I'm gonna motor through these last few because I mean, we've already gone over three hours and we've got a speed. Beautiful, beautiful layout though. Also love the text that they used on these sub, these uh, date windows back in the day. ETA powered. Rolex parts. I mean, I wish we had these watches again, you know. <laughs> Very nice Tudor specimen. <laughs> we need a P02. It's funny. This is from Tarek. Now, Tarek has, over the last few shows, he's been submitting IWCs in. And this is a Portofino hand wound. Um, he loves his IWCs. He sent in four separate photos of the watch on the wrist. And uh, it's nice seeing some IWC love. We haven't seen many of those lately. Um, so it's got an eight-day power reserve subdial, and the Portofino. I don't know much about the brand, about the the name and the family where it comes from, but this is popular. I mean, I've I've seen a couple of fashion savvy people wearing these pieces, and some saying it's a bit big. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's pretty large. I think it's about 44, 44 mils roundabout. Seems like lots of fashion savvy people wear these watches. Mr. Porter tends to do a lot of sponsorships with IWC. And this watch in particular, great level of contrast. We get to see the red accents on the dial. I like how he's captured some red lighting in the corner, so he's able to see those details. Um, sent in some nice photos. <laughs> and I think this might have been his son that made this for him <laughs> as a trial run to get the watch to fit him. I thought that was funny. Or maybe he did this as a, as a warm up just to see if the watch would actually fit. Highly recommend you do this, by the way, getting into the hobby and, and picking up a watch of this price. You might want to experiment and see what the size is like on the wrist before you pick it up, um, you know, prior to actually buying it, you know, everything else. Uh, Mr. Porter, IWC, both owned by Richemont, Giza. That's for, I, didn't know, I didn't know Mr. Porter was owned by Richemont. I learned something every day, I tell you what, everyone. Enamel dial, is that so? That is superb. I mean, it's a really interesting watch. I need to look at IWC more in general. There's so many. The Portuguese, uh, there's a lot. Next is from Tetley. I don't know if Tetley's still in the chat, but it is quite the Omega. So it's it's 72 Seamaster uh, SMF. So it's Seamaster F300. So 300 hertz. Is that, is that what it is? 
I really don't know. But this is some crazy looking piece. Uh, this is a real 70s era model uh, tuning fork. Is that so pilot style? Not enamel, it's paper. Oh, Tom Austin, got it, got it. Ted Lee really loves his tea. Yeah, absolutely. So we see that the 70s motifs translated through this watch all the way. Um, beautiful layout. I mean, it's just 70s through and through, a real tool watch. Gorgeous photo as well. I mean, you get to see every little detail. Um, so that was that's what it was about. It used a tuning fork back in the day for its for its oscillation, its uh, its rate, its beat rate, and everything else. Um, I need to study these watches in more detail. If I remember right, Omega had some crazy quartz pieces back in the day. They wanted to be the most accurate out there, and they did all sorts of ridiculous things with regards to killing their batteries to make them the most effective out there. Um, nice seeing a Seamaster. And check how cool they've done the bezel and the, the case placement. Bezel sitting inside the case. And it's that, that coin edging, man. Why these watches don't have more coin edging nowadays, I don't know. It's so understated and out of the way until you need it, you know. Uh, gorgeous. Real 70s inspired all the way through. We have the original text on the dial. It's just, yeah, 70s gem. Another highlight that I love is the, the logo on the top and the hand matching in color, red, nice highlight, 70s. So Tetley, thank you. I'm sure you must be sleeping by now. And Toki Vulture, thank you so much. I wouldn't call myself the best channel on YouTube. No ways, not by, not by a long shot, but uh, I just love looking at things a little bit differently, and I think we all should. Next, we have our brother, Thomas Burnett, who's in the chat currently. I said, send me a wrist shot, and he sent me his 50s era Seamaster, as he's sitting in his little studio at home. He loves music and sound recording and everything else. Uh, and it's so good seeing it in context. Uh, I'd love to see the studio in more detail. Take more shots like this, Thomas, in future. But he has it on a beads of rice. If you haven't seen my review of his collection, highly recommend you check it out. Uh, this is one of his first watches that he got, that he inherited, if I remember right. It's just beautiful. And it's in such good condition, too. I mean, he really looks after it. This was, I mean, Omega design in the heyday, you know, late 40s, early 50s, beautiful alpha style hands, text. I mean, this is an original, ah, oh, it's a gem. Uh, let's see, there was a super chat I just missed from Mr. Perpetual. Thank you so much, Mr. Perpetual. Uh, absolute pleasure having you. Highly recommend if you are still here, catch up for the last few because there are some amazing watches to come in a second before we sign out. I can't believe how long the show has been, but it's good. I mean, coffee seems to work. And once I get warmed up, I'm in the show. So it's not a sprint. Life is not a sprint, as we all know. Thomas Burnett, you know it, man. This is this is your watch. This is Thomas's. I mean, we should call this the Burnett from now on, you know? Um, beautiful. And on a beads of rice as well. It's just such a character. Okay. Carrying on from Tobias. Oh, yes. Okay. So Tobias sent these in. Last few minutes before the show as well. These are one of the last submissions. And we've got our first Daytona at the very end. <laughs> and it's a beautiful panda. And what a shot, right? 116500LN. Got to love a panda. Uh, of course, it's, it's the hype watch. Everyone loves it. But uh, saying that, in this kind of lighting, you get to see just why just why it stands out so well. Dinner and my battery is dying. Dying is perpetual. It's funny. <laughs> Uh, beautiful shot. I mean, the photo is just incredible. I featured this on Instagram tonight, and um, hope it's not from HH, Durban Mark. It's funny. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure this is genuine. How could we tell? I mean, the dial looks pretty legit. You look at all the details. It's down to the simplest things. I mean, just the text. Text is nice and clear. We get right up close. You can see it's nice and bold. Uh, there's lots of telltale signs, but it's just beautiful. And there's another shot. I can't remember the story of all the watches that he sent in, but I mean, he, he just loves wearing it. This is him wearing it at the office. I don't know, what's this pen? If anyone knows what pen this is, mention it in the chat. Uh, looks legit, looks totally legit, just kidding, yeah, funny. Okay, another hit from the coffee. This is the last of my, co I'm drinking the dregs of my coffee at this point. $22,000, Mr. Perpetual, I just, there we go, Spike has mentioned the name. Uh, thank you for that, I, me and pens, don't know a thing. The thing is, industrial designers generally, we go through pens like we do paper. So, <laughs> Beck, absolutely. We go through pens like paper. So generally, you know, over the course of like three days, we chuck it to the next one. Uh, pretty irresponsible, but that's kind of how it works. You use a lot of ink. 
Um, thank you, Johnny Boy. So it's just, I mean, a beautiful condition. Uh, he's still got the the plastic on the the. I'm losing my train of thought here. He's got the plastic on the center link still. Looks like he's still got the plastic on the clasp. So this watch is kind of a safe queen to say it's it's in good condition. And jumping through to the next, this is also from Tobias. I love these photos, Tobias. If you're if you're here or if you're going to catch up, <clears throat> don't remember the last time I wrote something down, Zane. Yeah, true. I mean. How often do we use pens nowadays? Um, <laughs> uh, pilot style, you're on fire. So this is called a Legend Edition Speedmaster. I would imagine it uses a coaxial movement, has the Paul Newman-esque elements to it. Um, gorgeous balance and layout. Also like the way that the, the bracelet integrates and how it sits, nice and rounded. Uh, he loves his chronographs. Tobias sent in some gorgeous photos as well. Uh, we're going to be getting through them now. It's so a great contrast. Nice, awesome colors in the background. Well, that could be just flowers. I don't know. Um, great seeing that that panda, Paul Newman aesthetic. And then we jump through to a professional. Now, this was his first watch. He still loves it to this day. And that says something about this hobby, you know. This is awesome that he's, he's also, this is awesome that he is also a chronograph wearer and lover. Uh, professional, legend edition, and a Daytona. It's obviously his style. It's nice seeing that together. Um, and since this is his first watch, he still loves it to this day, wears it often, and you just can't go wrong with a professional. I mean, it's just a, yeah, can't go wrong with a moon watch, as Dear Artifact says. Yeah, it's a gorgeous piece. Great, again, great setting, great photo. This looks like he's at the office somewhere. Really bumped up that contrast well, you know. Moon baby. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so Tobias next, and here we go. Last but not least, beautiful Milgaus. Oh, got to love that explosion of blue orange highlights and he really knows how to match the colors hey got the cuff got the sweater going on there got the lighting yeah the milgaus is quite a gem it's quite a hidden gem i feel like this watch is really going to uh pull a lot of attention in at time and in, in the future i should say uh rolex is probably going to discontinue this very soon i would imagine that these this watch in particular is going to be discontinued maybe this year maybe next year uh Gotta love a Z Blue. I don't think I've ever had a show, a wrist shot show, without a Z Blue Milgaus featured, which is quite special. Uh, it's kind of like the the underlying hero of the show. I'll wait until it's discontinued. Yeah, it's going to go fast. And I, I love the video that I did on this piece. Great history and discussion of this watch and uh, the brand. I called it. If you'd like to look, I called it the Einstein Rolex and talked about the 1019 and the original that incorporated the tonograph elements and just how this watch balances the dress and sports motifs together. It does a great job. Just crazy and bizarre. It was Rolex when they were, when they were kind of smoking up in the office, you know? Nowadays, they would never do something like this. Just great. Okay, next. So, Tobias, thank you. Beautiful photos. Let's have another look at that Daytona one more time. I love this shot. I love the contrast and the lighting. Gorgeous. Just amazing. One of the best shots of the show. Best photos by far. Okay, next, Tom. Just rocking your typical standard, but quite rare, is the uh, the 114270, the last of the last. And this model, I think, has the engraved rehort. Yeah, this has the engraved rehort on the bezel, which means that it's the last variant. No? Okay, let me know. The Sony 1019 Turkey Vulture, that's beautiful. I think the 1019 has the 1016 uh, in a few places. The, when we look at the... I highly recommend you watch the video. I go into detail about the numerals on the bezel. It was a long time ago, so uh, it's quite an old video, but hey. And David Williams, thank you so much. I loved looking at your pieces uh, at the beginning of the show. Since your name's D, you are able to see it earlier on. Um, so it's amazing just how often the Explorer shows up. Hey? Everyone likes to throw in their hat. I think one day we could we could do an Explorer-only show, and everyone just throws in what they have. Explorer 1s, 2s, 3s whole deal you know 10 16s 1655s okay thank you for this tom next we're jumping to williams watches and williams watches last week last time we did the show he closed off the show with this beautiful champagne uh champagne oyster perpetual there's a little hound in the background here uh it's this is gorgeous i mean if you watch the uh the last show two weeks ago this is highlighted in in green maybe he's still here yes he is there he is great having you here williams watches and 
Yeah, it's beautiful. This champagne, I don't know what you would call it. It's almost like a, a lager, a lager yellow champagne finish with double batons at the quarters. And then he also threw in his Smith's Everest in that green lit. I'm sure this must be your, your bar in your man cave that uses this light. Um, Smith's Everest, again, one of the last watches of the show. It's pretty fitting to feature it as well. We've seen a lot of Smith's watches too, right? It's insane. One show, we've seen quite a lot of variety. Uh, so as always, Williams watches, it's a pleasure. And in this light, it actually matches the face brick. How cool is that? It's almost like a brown in this, in this lighting. Yeah, just a pleasure. So it's always nice seeing this. This is always one of the pieces that caps off the show. And then we go through to watch in prey. Talking about our oh, 57, I don't know why my Magic Mouse is doing this. We featured a 57 Seamaster. Now we have a 57 Speedmaster. Two, two watches from the same family, two different guys, both rocking these 57 trilogy pieces. I mean, what are the odds of that? Same show. This is the first time we've ever featured Broad Arrow Omegas on the show. And we get like, what, three or four in one sitting. It's amazing. And watch and praise there. Great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I mean, the Speedmaster, this, this was the original Speedmaster. I love the fact that all of these watches were brought out in 57 and that uh, this watch has been around ever since and developed. We know that this was kind of the failed experiment. You know, they didn't, they were trying to compete with uh, what, Hoya, uh, what other brands in the 50s? What was a good chronograph brand in the 50s? I'm lost. This is my three hour mark. You can imagine I'm a bit slow. But uh, they didn't get into the racing scene, and then suddenly they were chosen for space, and so it evolved. And just all the little details, like the, the straight lugs, the layout, the applied. I've noticed that this is an applied logo as well, something quite unique, uh, special. It's a special watch. I mean, these Trilogy watches are very, very unique to the family. Looks super shiny. Yeah, it does. really does. Lots of these elements are polished, like the, like the lugs. The bezel's also fully polished. Uh, end link, everything else. We've got two more. Two more watches from Zahid and from Zane, and then we're going to cap it off. So this is what we've all been waiting for. And Thomas, thank you so much for the super chat, man. Always, as always, it's a pleasure. Loved your emails. We've been managed to chat a little bit this week, which was great. And uh, I love entertaining you guys and girls, whoever's in the chat, who's ever watching this again. So the last two watches for the show. And again, uh, watch and pray. Thank you for sending this in. Absolute pleasure. And it's amazing seeing no Brightlings or Hoyas, no Claudia, nothing. <laughs> it goes to show sometimes uh, Hoyer in the 50s. I don't know if they had watches in the 50s. Zenith as a competitor. Yes, Mountain Standard Time. You could be right. Um, it's funny how some shows are sparse and other shows have quintuplets of others, you know. Okay, so last but not least, we've got two more. We've got Zahid with his 1999-16610. So it's standard five-digit reference date Submariner. He's had this watch since then, I would imagine, and love seeing it in the light. It's great seeing this context. Hoplite for the coffee fund. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for the super chat. <laughs> I'd actually need it, you know. Coffee is a coffee is an important thing when it comes to writing and preparing. And uh, yeah, it's great seeing this watch in the light. So this obviously has uh, C three Luminova. Doesn't have uh, doesn't have tritium. In 99, I would imagine they transitioned to Luminova at this point in time, but it is a classic. We love our five-digit references. Uh, put me in a big shift. Yeah, Hans, but it was great. I mean, the watches that were sent in was just superb. And uh, yes, Jerry, we are going to wrap the party up right now. Three and a half hours. This is a record setter, ladies and gentlemen. And Turkey Vulture, thank you for the super chat. It's a pleasure. And now finally, Carlos, it would be nice to see them if they did have to, if they did bring these cases back in a way or another, did some sort of evolution Last but not least, from Zane, only watch that he submitted, and he said this would be his only watch if he had the opportunity, Aquanaut Travel Time. It's always great to end up with a sports dress piece, and I would love to do, I'm actually working on a discussion looking at the Calatrava variant of this and the, the Aquanaut, and talk about just how the design team have been able to bring these watches together in the Patek family. Um, of all the, the Aquanauts, I think the travel time is the one that speaks to me the most because what I like so much, especially this complication, is just the, the, the sheer intellect that goes into crown guards and pushes on the case. I love the idea that there's symmetry there, and there's just symmetry throughout the dial. 
That's what makes it so good. Um, I really don't like an offset date window on a watch like this, it just breaks it. Having a date window at the base with an inset grenade texture, and then you've got cleanliness all the way through. You've got a home and local time and your, your actual GMT hand is hidden behind here as a skeleton. It's, it's beautiful, really nice approach, sporty, elegant. This, I mean, these watches are so desired now, it's, it's getting ridiculous. But I think of all the Aquanauts, if it was for me, the grenade is really cool. I like the, the olive green, but this one to me, the, the balance, the sheer balance on the dial is what really speaks to me the most about this piece. And uh, yeah, that's, it's a pretty good way to sign off. Zane, Zane always had a great, great watch. <laughs> Uh, next week, unboxing Austin Daniels' Drunken Show. That's so funny, Carlos. Uh, Mountain Standard Time, absolutely such a pleasure. Such a pleasure doing this. And uh, you all really contributed the most to this. Everyone here, this is what I love so much, is that I'm just the curator. You're the ones who send all of this in and actually are a part of the show. And thank you, Ron, so much. I hope you hope you managed to jump in and out of the show. I don't know. You must be very busy at this time. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a great way to end off the show. We've had a look at everything from Patex to Lungas to Rolex, Omega, Zeniths, lots of Zeniths, Smiths. I mean, the list is just endless. So again, mark your calendars, April 9th, Thursday. It's going to be my unveiling of my first watch. And then on top of that, we're going to have wrist shot week as well. So I'll be able to talk about the watch and the wearing experience, how I've loved it over the last three weeks, which will be great. And uh, yeah, everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to close this off because we've been going nuts. And again, Zane, thank you for sending this in. Uh, Aquanaut Travel Time is a gem, and I can't wait to talk about this and the Calatrava. Let me just pull this up, stop sharing the screen, and just give my send-offs, and thank you all. That's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure doing this, uh, especially at this time, being able to discuss the level of variety that we all have, that we can all enjoy these watches together, take our mind off the rubbish that's going on in the world, and... Uh, you guys are great. The fact that you're here to actually be a part of the show, chat, collaborate, talk. Uh, we learn a lot more about what we are wearing, which is important. Not, not watches that are advertised to us uh, by watch stores, etc., etc. It's nice seeing what the actual consumer is wearing in our community. And it's just amazing seeing that variety, right? And uh, I saw a super chat here from, from Ant's Art of Pleasure. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. And Les, guys, thank you all so much. It's been... First Omega for your first Omega, but uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but we'll get to it. Uh, the unveiling is going to happen, and uh, I'm not telling you whether it's a Rolex or Omega. You're going to have to keep guessing. I'll definitely put a poll up for all of you to check out, and uh, you can all predict what first Omega in space, Nick J says. Hmm, you might be right, Nick. It might not be right. Uh, I look forward to hearing about guys eating their hats, whether or not I got an Explorer. That's something to take away from it. But uh, yeah, again, I have to thank everyone who's been a part of the show. I also want to thank everyone who is fighting the good fight out there, uh, staying home, looking after their families, but also those who are managing to look after everyone else in the world with regards to service delivery, with regards to posts, with regards to looking after stores and stocks and food and supply and everything that we all need. And uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a crazy time we're living in, but all I can say is this hobby of ours is something that brings us all together. We get to take our mind off the world, and I think that's the greatest joy. These watches, and you learn a lot about time. Time is a, is a beautiful thing, and I think it should be celebrated uh, a lot more and appreciated a lot more in this world we live in. But uh, yeah, everyone, take care of yourself. Please take the right precautions. Look after your family. Uh, eat your vitamins. Keep your, keep your diet strong. Stay safe. And I will see you in the next one, April 9th, two weeks away from now. We're going to have a great show again. Thanks. Good night. Good morning, wherever you are in the world. And I'll see you soon. Cheers, everyone.